Welcome back, everybody. It's uh, uh, it's good to uh, see you again after our short break. Um, we have um, one of our more important conversations of the day, which is actually to discuss some of the ways that the citizens of the United States and actually around the world are sort of fighting back against concentrated power, against the power of Google and Facebook. Uh, this is uh, the title of this uh, panel is The Fight Underway, and uh, we uh, are going to be discussing uh, uh, with Sally Hubbard, uh, working as the moderator, we're going to be discussing uh, some of the cases that have uh, been brought, um, uh, importantly, by uh, private citizens uh, uh, operating through the, the public courts, uh, such as the, uh, there's, there's a case that was filed originally in West Virginia against the monopolization of advertising by Google and Facebook. Uh, and it's actually that case, as we will learn, has expanded greatly just in the last couple of days. Also, very importantly, in fact, it's one of the most uh, uh, important things that's happened in antitrust and competition policy the last two years, which is actually the last hundred years, which is that uh, the state AGs of the United States have gotten into the game in a way that has entirely transformed conversation about power and what we do about it in this country. Never before have we seen this, uh, the, the people of the United States operating through their state AGs uh, sort of stand up to concentrated power the way we have these last two years. And uh, so we have a terrifically important, uh, great uh, collection of people as part of this panel. Um, I'm just going to start with Keith Ellison, the Attorney General of Minnesota. Uh, you know, uh, uh, General Ellison was uh, sort of uh, has served as the Attorney General since uh, January 2019. He that's when he became the Minnesota's first African American elected to a statewide office. Previously, uh, uh, Attorney General Ellison served as the U.S. Representative to the Fifth Congressional District. Uh, when he became the first Muslim elected to Congress, the United States Congress. Uh, while he was in Congress, uh, Attorney General Ellison was the head of the Progressive Caucus in Congress. And he was on the House Subcommittee on Capital Markets and Government-Sponsored Enterprises. Uh, but that actually just, he just barely begins to touch uh, the truth about uh, 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 Attorney General Ellison. Uh, I got to work with uh, the with, uh, Attorney General Ellison while he was in, in Congress, and I've gotten to work with him since he's been a, a state attorney general. Uh, and he is one of the people who understands this concentration of power and the threat it poses to American democracy better than anybody else. And uh, he has used his, whatever position he's in, he's used it to its fullest to bring the people of the United States together to restore our democracy and to expand it so that it works for all people. And, and, he, and, and Attorney General Ellison has, he's been really quite busy this last period dealing with among other things, the, uh, uh, the prosecution of uh, Derek Chauvin in Minnesota. And it's really terrific to have you today, uh, Attorney General. Thank uh, you, also, thanks Barry. Yeah, and I'm just going to run through everybody and uh, real quick, uh, and then turn it over to Sally and actually into um, Attorney General Ellison. Uh, we also have Dina Srinivasan, uh, who uh, is uh, has been working on one of these antitrust cases against Google, the one that was filed uh, sort of by a, a group of states attorneys general led by Texas. Uh, uh, Dina's research and economic analysis uh, has pr provided a foundation for uh, much of the government enforcement of antitrust laws against these two uh, corporations. Uh, her recent paper, Why Google Dominates Advertising Markets, showed that Google distorts electronically traded ad markets by engaging in conduct that lawmakers would normally prohibit or actually probably have prohibited. It just hasn't been enforced. Uh, it's great to have you, Dina. Uh, Doug Reynolds is the managing editor of HD Media Company, uh, which is a publisher of newspapers in West Virginia, including the Charleston Gazette Mail. Um, uh, Doug purchased the Herald Dispatch uh, back in 2013. Uh, he, most recently, uh, he has been the, uh, and this is very important, the leading plaintiff in an antitrust lawsuit against uh, Facebook and Alphabet, Google's parent company. And the lawsuit is the first of its kind filed by a news outlet, and it alleges that the tech Titans have been monopolizing the digital ad market. 
Uh, and then we also have Tim Cowan, who is the chair of the antitrust practice uh, at uh, Preskill and, and Company, which is a London law firm. And uh, I've worked with Tim for a long time, and he is a brilliant antitrust lawyer, one of the very best. Uh, he's been a leading force in advocating for the liberalization of the EU market and the system of law that promotes competition. Uh, and, uh, you know, he has uh, uh, got some uh, recent work that he was going to be sharing with us today. Anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Sally Hubbard, who, as you'll remember, uh, is the Director of Enforcement Policy here at uh, Open uh, Markets and is uh, herself a force to reckon with in dealing with the... Uh, uh, the power of Google and Facebook. All right, thank you, Barry, and thanks for thanks to all the panelists who are here. Um, I wanted to follow up on something Klobuchar, Senator Klobuchar said in her speech, which is, I refuse to say this is just too hard to do. And I think this is a good turning point for our day because we've spent a lot of time talking about the terrible state of the status quo regarding Facebook and Google and news. And uh, this is a point at which we talk about the fight back and we talk about how the way things are, are not, is not the way it has to be. It's the result of policy choices, choices that allowed monopolization and uh, you know, privacy violations and things that we wouldn't tolerate in other markets as Dina has pointed out in her research, allowing private corporations to be basically the stock exchange and the buyer and the seller on that exchange. We don't allow these things in other industries. So, we do have the power to change the status quo. We don't have to accept the way it is. And we've got actions in the work and that's what we're gonna, in the works and that's what we're gonna talk about on this panel. So starting uh, with the Attorney General Ellison, could you talk about the cases that Minnesota has joined against uh, the multi-state actions uh, enforcing the antitrust laws against Facebook and Google? Could you just tell us a little about those cases and what you hope they will achieve. Yeah, thanks, I'd be happy to. Well, you know, it all comes down to the fact that in the Facebook uh, matter, uh, we, uh, attorney generals, about 48 of us, and then, again, then there's the Google matter with about 38 of us. Uh, I'll start with the uh, Facebook case, and we allege that the company's illegally stifled and continues to stifle uh, in an illegal manner competition uh, they're trying to protect their monopoly power. Uh, in our lawsuit, we detail and make clear that over the last decade that the social networking, um, you know, gargantuan has been illegally acquiring comp competitors in a predatory manner, cut services to smaller companies out there that they view threatening, depriving users of the benefits of competition, uh, reducing private protections and services along the way, uh, you know, uh, in, you know, since 2004, for example, we argue that Facebook has operated as a personal uh, social networking service that facilitates sharing online content and so forth without charging unit, uh, people a fee, but they do get their compensation in the form of uh, all the information that they gather and that they retain and that they keep and they use for their own benefit and to their advantage. And they monetize all that information by selling it to advertisers uh, at tremendous value to themselves. Uh, and so what are the allegations in our complaint regarding Facebook? You know, when we filed that lawsuit, we alleged Facebook violated Section 2 of the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. Uh, as you all know on this call, uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 makes it illegal to monopolize or attempt to monopolize any part of the trade or commerce among the states. Uh, Facebook, uh, you know, started as an innovative company, um, you know, but has fended off early competitors by offering a, a good product. Well, things have changed. Uh, and once it gained market power, it is now actively sought to, mon to monopolize markets. And, uh, you know, and it, once it achieved the, that status, it has fought off uh, competitors and uh, diminished competition. We also allege that it violated Section 7 of the Clayton Act, which prohibits mergers and acquisitions that substantially lessen competition or tend to create monopoly. Facebook uh, bought two major fast-growing competitors, Instagram and WhatsApp, very useful, very important, very helpful, but 
that acquisition diminished competition. And each acquisition violated the Clayton Act in our view because they submitted Facebook status as a monopoly and eliminated major competitive threats. And uh, you know they, they, they reduced privacy and, uh, and, and reduced options for consumers. Uh, you know, they, as I said, they, they acquired competitive threats against them, they, you know, and, and, uh, and they, they cut competition uh, overnight. Uh, and then, you know, an area of advertising uh, as a consequence of their expansive user base and vast data that they collect from users like us, all of us. Facebook, or, Facebook is uh, able to sell highly valued advertising. The volume, speed, and variety of their uh, user data give it an unprecedented virtually 360 degree view of consumers and their contacts, interests, preferences, activities, and they use it to their advantage. Uh, and of course, um, you know, so that's a little bit about that particular lawsuit. When it comes to the, the other one, the Google lawsuit, you know, of course we're suing them under section two of the Google Act, so Google, um, under the section two of the Sherman Act and we're uh, alleging that they maintain monopoly power over the general research engine and related advertising marketing through any competitive exclusionary contracts and conduct. You know, as a result, Google has deprived consumers of competition that could lead to greater choice, greater innovation, better privacy protections. And furthermore, Google has exploited its market position to accumulate and leverage data to the disadvantage of everybody um, and so I'll just go to a few of our major allegations. Um, you know, we are asserting, asserting that uh, the use that Google uses exclusionary agreements and other practices to limit uh, the ability of rival general search engines and potential rivals to reach customers. And this conduct cements Google as a go-to search engine. You know, the fact is, we know the other ones are out there. I use. Um, other search engines myself, uh, but when they basically search engine and Google are almost united in people's mind, like Kleenex and facial tissue. And that is not a good thing. We need more players in this market. They also disadvantage users uh, of its search uh, advertising management tool, which is called SA360, by promising that it would not favor Google search advertising over that of competing search engines such as Bing. Instead, Google continuously favors advertising on its own platform, inflating its profits to the detriment of advertisers and consumers. And then our third major allegation is that it discriminates against specialized search sites, such as those who that provide travel, home repair, entertainment services, by depriving them to the real uh, prime real estate, because, by depriving them of the real prime real estate, because uh, they uh, these these other sites threaten Google's revenue and dominant position. So, you know, in, in some, we argue that more competition in general search engine market would benefit consumers through improved privacy protections, uh, more targeted results and opportunities for consumers, and competitive general search engines also uh, would offer better quality in advertising and lower prices to consumers. So uh, there's much more to say, but as you can imagine, both of the complaints in this case are, you know, inches high off the table, but those are the, that's essentially the heart of the matter. And I'd be more than happy to, to uh, elaborate further if you like. Um, what I'd like to know, you know, is we've been talking throughout the day about how antitrust is kind of one important part of the solution for news. It's obviously not the entire solution, but it is part of it. And I'd like to know what you hope these lawsuits will achieve, particularly regarding kind of these problems of the choke points and the monopolization of digital advertising um, that, you know, so imperil the news industry. We're hoping that they will do a number of things. Both of these lawsuits, we hope, will open up competition for more actors, offer more product differentiation, more options for consumers, put some downward pressure on price. We also think that we could hopefully, hopefully somebody in this market uh, with a little help of government regulation is gonna really figure out how to say that protecting your data is an important thing. They use our data, they make a lot of money on it, 
then and, and Lord knows uh, that it's used for purposes that really most people don't really realize uh, are going to be it's going to be used for. But it would be great if uh, so. Some of the players who are trying to get comp- get a competitive space in the market say we're going to be better at protecting your data, so use us. Um, and so there, these are just a few things that we hope to achieve. Uh, you know, I believe uh, that that anti-competitive markets are probably most responsible for economic stagnation for working people, for the ten-year um, malaise of startups. I know we've seen a little extra activity recently, but if you look at it over a slightly longer period, the United States has not been the startup engine that it has been over the most of the nation's history. And I think it has a lot to do with market concentration, particularly in these areas. So those are some things we want to achieve. Well, that uh, sounds wonderful. And I I completely agree with you about the causes of the harms that we're having today. Um, I also want to get Dina Srinivasan's opinion quickly, given her um, background as an ad tech executive. Dina, could you um, give your thoughts on, on these cases or... I know you can only talk a little bit, um, but particularly you could talk about uh, Facebook's monopolization of the ad tech ecosystem and how that affects news. Sure, thank you, Sally. So I worked for many years in the industry and one of the reasons I decided to pivot and write about the industry and write about antitrust was because I was seeing a lot of market power problems that I thought at the time were underappreciated in large part because these markets are free where the cost is sort of stable at zero. And um, the other thing I noticed in when, when I was in the industry is that you know from an advertising revenue perspective, there were two outliers in the market that were always growing you know, rapidly every year and the other actors in the market were, were sort of not able to keep up whatsoever. And those of course were Google and Facebook. Um, and, and so that's, you know, those are, those are a couple of things that I was seeing when I was in the industry. Um, Sally, what was your question again, though? I want to stay on point here. Well, I know, um, are, can you, I you know you have limits on what you can talk about regarding the Google case that you're involved in, right? Do you have other thoughts on, on uh, what the attorney general was talking about from your um, work on Facebook? Sure, two things. I mean, I think it's high time for privacy legislation in the United States to protect consumers. We're going to need something at a federal level. It's going to be a patchwork mess if we approach it only at a state level. Um, you know, the other thing that I would say from a very big picture perspective is it's just fantastic that we have so many state attorneys general that are doing this heavy lift here with regards to these antitrust cases. And also fantastic, you know, that that we're going after um, uh, companies with practically, I think, trillion dollar valuations um, in order to defend a people's privacy. So from a very big picture perspective, I just I just think it's fantastic that we we have some of these uh, things going on now. Okay, now uh, moving to some of the uh, private enforcement we have going on. Doug, um, could you tell us about your experiences um, at the Charleston Gazette Mail and what led you to file the case, the antitrust case against Facebook and Google? Oh, you're on mute. Um, thank you for having me here. It's really an honor to be with such an esteemed group of people. Um, there was a group of investors that originally bought the Herald Dispatch in 2013. And there was people from all kinds of different industries that were here in the local community. And over the next several years, we bought several other papers, including the, the Charleston Gazette, really with the, uh, with the intent. Most of them were in um, pretty rough financial shape of kind of bringing new ideas and investment and trying to, and try to grow the business. And over that time, we, we kind of went in and we noticed that digital revenues have been growing kind of low double digits and uh, print revenues were going down, you know, a couple single digits a year and felt like that we could transition these businesses into digital businesses. And then around 2013, 14, we noticed something started changing. Um, most of us had thought about, had tried to use Facebook, Google. Um, there was all kind of widgets and other things that they would come out with to try to partner with uh, to try to grow our business. And what we generally found was is 
uh, the things would maybe work well at the beginning, and then they would be another service or something that would change. And it, it just seemed like the digital revenue was becoming dominated by those two, those two players. And during this time, we would go to conferences and talk to people. And there was, there was people way out ahead of us in terms of thought process of understanding what was going on in the marketplace. I mean, real time, I'm not sure we really understood it. But you know, what, what we seem to find is that more and more of those dollars and more control of our content, uh, more of our readers were coming through, coming through Facebook. And so we felt like we were sort of trapped. And I'll be honest with you, not until I really read uh, Miss uh, Srinivasan's um, 2019 journal did I figure out or really start to be able to conceptualize, hey, what was really going on? And, uh, you know, that that's sort of how we got started and then um, started reading, you know, all the law cases and um, started talking to our attorneys about it. And they had this, um, you know, as they went into it, they got the stuff with Google and realized, you um, what the market impact that these really were monopolies and that they were using their monopoly power um, against us. And uh, how um, did you get the courage to bring the case? Because I, you mentioned the mentioned before about being trapped and that's kind of the common theme of the day. Um, what gave you the courage to step up and, 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 sue the company that you were, you know, under the control of in so many ways? Well, it was uh, the second worst decision we could make. And the first decision was to do nothing. Uh, that, that's how we say get the courage. We didn't, we didn't feel like long term that the journalism we want to do in our communities. Um, this was a paper that the year we bought the Gazette in 2018, the year before it won the Pulitzer Pulitzer Prize for journalism for their reporting on the opioids. Um, so in most businesses, if you'd say, if you're putting a great product out there, you should, uh, you should be able to be successful. And so um, we felt like that the only way to ensure that there's a future of journalism in our communities was to file the suit and try to change what the future looked like. All right, well, moving on to Tim. Tim has been following the monopolization of by Google of advertising for a very long time. And there's been some new tactics, new iterations that, um, that could also affect journalism that Tim isn't paying attention to. Could you talk a little bit about that, Tim? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm here in the UK. Uh, I've been running cases against Google for over 10 years. Uh, firstly, before the European Commission, and those are on appeal. And we've also got cases running in court. Um, what happened during the course of last year was that our Competition and Markets Authority, which is kind of a combination between a state attorney general and an antitrust division, it's a funny sort of administrative thing, but it has its own ability to issue orders um, and do reports. It did a very detailed report and it explained in great detail how Google is closing down the browser. Now, this is in part now reflected in your Texas the case that's run led by the Texas Attorney General. But, but this caught our attention and we said, well, you know, this is a major problem. And the publishing community said, this is a very, very big problem. I said, well, how so? You know, what's the size of the problem? Can you quantify it? And they said, yeah, we've got this nice paper here from Google. It explains that when we change the browser, we Google will reduce your revenue by between 50 and 70%. And that is a very big problem if you're a newspaper publisher. Um, I can share that with you later if you're interested. Um, so the, the, the issue then for us was, well, how do we address this swiftly? Uh, there's a bit of a sad joke here in Europe, which is what's the similarity between uh, Microsoft, Intel, and Google? To put you out of your misery, the answer is, in each case, the antitrust cases took 10 years. It's not a great joke, I'm sorry. It's a very sad state of affairs. But um, in order to bypass that, what we did was we put together a consortia. Um, the consortia is a, a separate entity, which is a not-for-profit. The consortia's members are all those that are affected by this, which is quite a big number of people. We're still looking for more. Um, publishers, ad tech uh, suppliers, analysts, people in the entire supply chain, and we applied for an injunction. Uh, that was filed late last year with the CMA here in the UK. They, as they have to, they have to investigate in great detail. We've, um, one of the benefits of this vehicle is that we can put forward witness statements. So we can put forward as evidence as you would 
in a court process in the States so we can provide that evidence. And as complainants in an antitrust investigation, uh, there's a degree of protection for the complainant. So it doesn't have to, you don't have to take the second worst decision or whatever uh, was just said. It, you have got the opportunity to actually get the public authority to take the case for you, which is now what's happening. So the, the CMA here in the UK is taking the action. Um, we've been in almost constant dialogue for the past three, three four months uh, on this. And I guess we're kind of in the, uh, in the early stages of that investigation, but hopefully it will be a lot quicker than any of the cases that have been taken before. Typically, the CMA will deal with a case within um, six to nine months. Um, so we could get a very swift decision either way. We don't know yet. But that's um, kind of addressing all of the failings of previous cases where nobody applied for an injunction. Um, nobody applied for interim measures. And so they couldn't get one. Um, I think that you'll see that also in the European, in front of the European Commission, they've been saying, please give us uh, an application. Unfortunately, the uh, the track record there is they take a long time. So we are seeing what I think are becoming known as the three musketeers, uh, which is the CMA in the UK, the Bundeskartell Act in Germany, and the ACCC in Australia that are kind of leading the way on digital competition matters. They announced here in the UK this morning they're going to take a much stricter approach towards killer acquisitions, which is also part of the, the, the case that's being brought in, in the courts by the state's attorney general in the US. Um, so we are seeing public authorities taking more of an action. Yes, indeed, that's a huge challenge for antitrust enforcement is the length of the cases. And it's great to hear that you guys are getting out ahead of the latest anti-competitive tactic with an injunction, something that we can learn from here in the US. I know it's frustrating uh, that we're still trying to solve simple problems like Google search, problems we've known about for about a decade as Google moves on to acquire DoubleClick to roll out a whole bunch of different, I mean, not, sorry, not DoubleClick, Fitbit. The oh. Fitbit is, cre we're creating the next generation of problems without having solved the first generation. Um, but, uh, I want to go back to the attorney general. Um, obviously, this is a constraint that the cases take a long time, but that's not a reason not to do them. Um, and they are a critical piece of the puzzle. And we also need to be pursuing, you know, legislation and other remedies that can take action right away or take effect sooner. Um, what do you think are the most important remedies that we should be seeking in those cases? Because um, we've seen particularly um, from some of the European enforcement against Google. Um, we've seen that small behavioral remedies and fines don't really change things. And we, what we really need to do is, you know, change the market structure. Um, so what do you think of yeah. the potential for That's a great, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. you okay. know what saying? Go ahead. I was gonna say, I, I think that's a super important question. Let me just take my own stab at it. Um, but first, I'd like to just state the obvious thing, just like the most obvious thing. And that is democracy depends on people knowing what's happening. If people don't know what's happening, they can't make good choices about their own governance. How do we know what's happening in the United States or even UK or anywhere, any free society? Be mostly because of like newspapers, whether they're online or in print. That's how we know what's happening because I read it in the paper. That's how we know. Well, newspapers depend on revenue. They don't have any, uh, or if their revenue is tightly controlled, they are not going to continue to exist, certainly not in a robust, dynamic, vibrant way that we are used to. The, you'll, you'll, you will see that you will not, you'll see at least two things happen. One thing you'll see happen is that the news itself will change. The newspapers will be forced to, 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 Put out, give us clickbait, which is basically, you know, online BS that doesn't really tell you anything, right? And the idea of an in-depth story that really tell you about a serious issue facing your community, it, it's too long, it's too complicated. No, nope, back to the cat story. And the other thing that we see is that some papers just won't survive. You know, they'll be gone. So you, 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 you run that play enough times and what you end up is far fewer uh, sources of news 
with lower level of informational content. And so that is why this thing is so intriguing to me and my colleagues. It threatens the structure of our society. And uh, then there's all kinds of other problems that we know about. We know that uh, you know the most, the, the most well-resourced uh, people will stay in the game. Maybe they don't have the best interests of the public at heart. There have been a number of stories out there about how there are folks in the business of news, not for news, but for ideology, pushing information. They're motivated and they'll somehow find a way to survive uh, because they wanna push a line. But the idea that we just have an informed, well-educated society with people who can make good decisions about the general welfare, that idea will be under threat. So what, what remedies? I think one of the main things we need to do which is why I stay in close contact with Cicilline and Klobuchar is they just made it too hard and expensive to, and too long to bring a, a, an antitrust lawsuit. It shouldn't be this difficult. You gotta, we, are, we now have to reach deep in our pockets and figure out how to pay for all these experts that run in the you know real pretty penny, right? They're expensive and they take a long time. The burden is on us, we've got to prove that this acquisition, this merger is anti-competitive. They don't have to prove that it isn't, you know? And there are a number of things that just need to shift structurally. And so it needs to be faster. It needs to be easier to do. Uh, and in a country dedicated to, you know, that we say we're about free enterprise, we're not, a, there's nothing free enterprise about monopoly. In fact, it's the opposite concept. It's the opposite concept. You know, in America, we if a big business says we're leaving, then government throws money at them. And I'm talking about in the local community. It should be the opposite. We should be throwing it money at the small businesses to seed them and tell the big businesses, you know, you're big, you're a capitalist. So what do you want from me? I'm the public. But we don't do that. We subsidize the big ones. And we and if mom and pop say that they're closing down, we say, well, lots of luck. Too bad. You know, that's how business can be. And we should be doing it the other way around from a public policy standpoint. And, you know, so this is a big complicated issue, but I think some of the things we need to do uh, is we, we, we need to make sure that, you know, that, that, that competitors can participate uh, on these platforms without discrimination, that the owner of the platform really shouldn't be able to be a participant in the platform at all, but they certainly shouldn't be able to privilege themselves in any way. And there needs to be regulation to make sure they can't do it. And there are a number of uh, other solutions and I've mentioned a few, but thanks for letting me rant a little bit. Uh, I'm always happy to hear an anti-monopoly rant because that's uh, what I spent my days doing. Um, uh, I wanted to hear from Doug, what do you hope your case will uh, lead to? What do you hope the outcome will be? Um, and what kinds of remedies do you think would most help journalism? Oh, you're muted. Um, you know, our central mission is to continue to empower the citizens in our community um, to be able to you know, hold government accountable. And what we'd want to see is a level playing field in the digital in the digital sphere. Um, you know, we should not, uh, the people that are running the system shouldn't get to participate unless there's clear disclosure as to what, what's going on within that, in that system. And then something that's very, um, very normal in, in the analog world of, of auditing results because you know as a newspaper or print you know we're subject to audits to the secretary of state the customers get to know everywhere where their insert goes things like that who, who, you know who where the end customer is and in the digital sphere that doesn't exist they they get to compete they get to and then they get to basically put out what their results are and only through this litigation are we starting to learn that the results that they claim they got for example on video and other ways weren't the results um, the customer was ended up getting. So I would hope that, you know, obviously that those in a perfect world, I like to see the companies broke up into these different companies to do different things. And um, short of that, there needs to be some type of government oversight as to um, what they're doing in the marketplace. Definitely. And uh, turning to Dina, I know Dina, you were talking before about how we need a privacy law. And of course the challenge is 
how to make sure that we don't have heavy lobbying. You know, big tech are now the biggest lobbyists of our federal government, um, and we don't want them to be crafting a weak federal privacy law that could uh, end up preempting the state efforts that are more protective of citizens' privacy. But um, you're talking about uh, how important a privacy law is, but I know you've also spent a lot of time thinking about how privacy and competition fit together. And these are two um, complementary, you know, and intertwined uh, fields that have often been siloed and we really need to be working on both fronts. So if you could give some thoughts about that, that would be great. Sure, Sally. So I think that, you know, the critical thing that we have to do when it comes to federal privacy legislation is really just pause um, for a minute or, or more than a minute and appreciate that when we're talking about Google and Facebook and we're talking about all of their revenue, which comes from online advertising, we're really talking about auction markets and we're really talking about electronically traded markets. And in these types of markets, we already have certain principles around how to regulate data and privacy. And so it's going to be critical to look to those principles and port them over to new digital markets that also trade um, electronically and auction markets so that we get privacy right. And I emphasize this because one of the things that I see often is a disjointed conversation between privacy and competition. And over on the privacy side, we might think, oh, you know, the only thing we need to think about is privacy or consumer privacy, and it doesn't really matter how we model those rules. But as we know, even from financial markets, the way that we model those rules is critical to making competition in the market work. And so we're just going to have to aim to get those two things right at the same time. Okay, I see uh, Tim has a comment here. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, we, you know, we're in active discussions with the authorities about remedies at the moment. And what's perhaps interesting for your audience is that the Competition and Markets Authority, which is the antitrust authority, is working very closely, which means that every submission that goes in is shared with the Information Commissioner's Office, which is our data protection body. Um, that's the first thing, which is, you know, both are looking at it at the same time, which I think is very important. The second thing is that if antitrust and privacy um, are applied properly, they can end up in the same place. So, you know, one of the things that I did in a previous life is I was uh, head of competition and, and regulation at BT, which is, you know, like AT&T, one of the telecoms companies. And we had very similar problems. You know, there are a lot of problems with local loop access, with control over monopoly facilities. And those are the types of remedies that oh, we've, we've addressed that here by separating out certain parts of the activity of a vertically integrated firm. And that can be done. Um, I think you need to start at the top of the supply chain, though. You just start with customers' data and give customers a choice. At the moment, end users, customers that are using the, the platform, which the platform is called users, um, they are being exploited and what's being imposed on them are completely unreasonable terms under which uh, they're, they're required to provide all of their personal identity information to the platforms. That's totally unnecessary for advertising. It's not necessary for publishing. In fact, the, the advertising and marketing communities use a separate identifier, an ID, which is different from your identity. So you don't need to part with all the information that we're giving at the moment. Um, so anyway, we're looking at that as an issue. We're looking at access to data as an issue. There have been remedies in, in various settings here in Europe. Um, and, and I would say that the, the BT remedy, which is you know, separating out the local access facilities, uh, was inspired by the AT&T consent decree. Um, I spent a lot of time in, in Washington talking to the Department of Justice about how to apply uh, the AT&T consent decree to BT back in the late 90s, and that's what we ended up with. We ended up with, with something that did work. I think it worked quite well in the States for a, a period of time before the reconsolidation. And I think you can draw inspiration from, you know, other network industries, other technology industries, and what's worked there. Um, I commend that to you, but I'm only giving you back what you exported to us some years ago. I think it's incredibly important to remember that we have encountered these same problems before. They're a different flavor, but they're essentially the same problems, whether it was the railroads or AT&T, and we've used our laws. 
uh, to fix these problems. These problems are fixable. Everyone here on this call is working on fixing these problems and uh, it's not a status quo that we need to just accept. It's not some essential way that the internet nat nat naturally is. Um, I have a question from the audience here for you, Tim, uh, based on uh, today's news. We had a lot of news today, uh, both that 139 newspapers uh, filed the suit uh, that Doug is uh, leading against, uh, you know, the class action, and also uh, Daily Mail sued Google today, and that's the audience uh, member has a question for you, Tim, on what do you think of that, of that news that Daily Mail sued Google over self-preferencing? I guess because you're British, you're being asked that one. <laughs> Well, I, I get, yeah, I mean, the Daily Mail, I believe, is a very, very big newspaper and has about 70 million or something. I read the press release before coming on here, 70 million users in, in the States. So um, it's a very big organization there. Um, I think it's very interesting they filed suit in the States. Um, you know, our courts are open and uh, they can do business as well. Um, the law is a bit different on, on either side of the Atlantic. We have, as I mentioned before, this ability to go after exploitative abuse, which is less easy in the States. If you look at what Google's doing, you know, one of the things that, again, I focus on the browser and I urge everybody to focus on the browser because that's the first step on any end user's journey onto the internet. You start with the browser. And what worries me about, you know, the current cases that are running, DOJ and other cases that are running, is they're dealing with the second stage, they're dealing with search or they're dealing with the exclusivity provisions between Apple and Google or, or Google and, and um, you know, the device manufacturers, all of those things, which we've seen here for many years. But really the start of the journey and perhaps the end run that Google's putting in place is dealt with in your jurisdiction by Texas. And there, I think what's happening is that Google is getting between the publisher's existing customer and disintermediating. So they're placing themselves first and preventing the customer getting through to the existing platform. Um, so, you know, all the publishers are affected by that. That's why 50 to 70% of revenue is at risk. Uh, you know, you could have a single sign on through the browser system. That is in Google's latest privacy sandbox proposals. There are 23 other proposals which are equally concerning. Um, you look at them in detail, and what you find is that there's a it's a maze, a very clever maze has been created. So if you think you can go out through one door, you can't, you, you get caught by another thing that they've put in place. So it's quite clear this has been carefully thought through, you know, by Google. And, um, you know, I think you may be able to run cases in parallel in the States and, and in, in uh, the UK. Whether you also do that in Europe as well depends on various different jurisdictional things. I think you'll start seeing that happening. Um, you know, in the past, we've left it to the, major authorities to do a lot of the work for us all. But um, I think that's breaking down. You know, the, uh, there are different jurisdictional opportunities. There's different procedural opportunities. Um, if you're a defendant, this is a real problem because, you know, the old game of, you know, delay and deny and defer doesn't work very well if you've got jurisdictions that move quickly naturally. You know, the UK is a place where you can apply for an injunction. You may or may not win. You end up on an appeal. You know, I did a case against the authority last year where we took the case three months later, we'd been to appeal, and then we made an application to the Court of Appeal. You know, you can actually hear the full decision on the appeal against the authority on judicial review within three months. And that's not the European court system, or to be honest, it's not your court system, which does take quite a while as well. Yeah, I'm always encouraged that the entire globe is trying to solve these problems. Um, you know, when I speak to regulators and enforcers, uh, you know, around the planet, um, that everyone is trying uh, to fix the problems, I think is a cause for optimism um, and a widespread recognition that this is not sustainable uh, for democracy or for citizens and how critical, particularly news is uh, for our democracies. I have another question I want to um, ask Attorney General Ellison from the audience here. Um, they say, what, what are the competition tools that we can, can use to deal with these issues? I know you spoke a bit about it with your complaints. Um, yeah. And what about this challenge of the consumer welfare standard and um, going after these problems with this narrow definition? 
Yeah, well, I'll just start with the consumer welfare standard and say that, you know, this really is a product of, say, the last 50 years. Before that, you know, we had a more expansive way to look at how a, um, yeah. a, a concentration, a merger or acquisition was going to affect folks. And we looked at all the stakeholders. This going back to this uh, consumer welfare model, which is, uh, you know, Robert Bork sort of theory, uh, really just, um, I think, um, is a very poor way to look at what uh, a, a merger could represent to a community. And we need to uh, attack that idea. And that's why I think it is important to stay in, in touch with the legislators, to give ourselves a broader definition. I think just even this conference challenging the consumer welfare concept is a great idea. You know, the idea that the only thing that matters is, is, is price in the short term to the consumer is just ignoring reality. Um, it, it, and, and so, but, but it does suit the people who wanna be monopolists. If you're in a position to monopolize the market, hey, you know, we're gonna reduce prices in the beginning, you know, and, and this is exactly um, falling into the trap that they have set. Uh, and so, you know, I actually believe not to be too conspiratorial about it, but that, you know, look, this is, this is, this is some folks who wanted to, you know, a acquire a lot of uh, wealth and power who just set out on a strategy uh, to, to do that. And the consumer welfare standard is a part of that. I mean, it came out of a particular place and time and circumstance uh, and was promoted uh, in competition with uh, the thinking of, of, of Justice Brandeis. I think we need to return to that time. We had an expansive idea about what we would do. Then when it comes to what to do about it, I think there's, you know, the tools are there there and, and there we might think of some new ones. But Sally, I like the idea that you had, which is this is not necessarily a new problem. Certainly the technology we're talking about is new, but the problem is not new. And I think the tools are break them up, absolutely must be on the table, regulate them more closely for um, any competitive practices. We need to say no to some of these mergers and acquisitions. I mean, I feel like whether it's Democratic or Republican president, FTC or in, in uh, DOJ, that we've never seen a merger we don't like. When's, when do we say no to these big people? We just got to start saying no. And then the fourth thing I think we really need, and I think this is the missing thing, we need to make this, we need to take this out of the academy. We need to take it out of elite circles. We need to, it has to be a discussion that it happens around kitchen tables, not, not just people who watch this stuff because they're into it. It needs to be, um, as, as um, Doug mentioned, something that his customers are talking about. You know, because, you know, what is more important to his customers uh, than some of these issues around competition? If Jimmy Johns and McDonald's say well, we're only going to pay seven bucks an hour, well, his customer, that affects them quite directly, you know? And then when you, you know, and of course, that's absolutely true in, in the fa Facebook and Google case as well. So let's break them up. Let's regulate them. Let's monitor them. Uh, if the merger needs to go through for some reason, let's make sure we scrutinize them. And let's change the rules of the game so that we're looking at a more expansive um, picture when we decide whether these things should happen, much broader than consumer welfare. I could not agree more. And uh, we are, we have one minute left. I want to give um, anyone an opportunity for some final, oh, no, we don't. Sorry, time. <laughs> <laughs> the, the clock changed. I was wrong on that. Um, we need to stick to our schedule, but I want to thank everyone for uh, joining today. This has been incredibly interesting, and I know you are all doing really important work that we could talk about for many hours, so I uh, appreciate trying to uh, give us the high-level view and uh, move toward action instead of accepting the status quo is very important. So thank you all, and I'll uh, kicking it back to Barry now. Thanks. Thank you, Sally. Um, as Sally said, that was a, a conversation that could easily have gone on for another couple of hours. And, um, uh, and it was really great to hear uh, sort of 
um, Attorney General Allison and Tim and Dina and, and Doug all sort of really put this in sort of a kitchen table language as Attorney General Ellison put it. Um, the, uh, and actually just one observation, just sort of uh, repeating something that Sally said. Sally said that she is always encouraged that the entire globe is trying to sort of solve these same problems simultaneously. And it's like, that should be encouraging to all of us. I mean, it's, it's uh, when you have this many people with this many government authorities around the world trying to deal with the same thing, um, you know, we, we have the power we need and we're going to solve this problem. You know, maybe not as soon as we sh should or as soon as we want to, but it's soon enough. Um, so uh, we have uh, one sh more short conversation and then we will be hearing from uh, Congressman Cicilline uh, and then we're going to have a short break. And so I'm going to uh, sort of get out of the way here by turning it over to back to Penny Abernathy, who, as I mentioned before, is someone I really wish I had gotten to know uh, some years back. Uh, Penny is uh, one of the great fighters uh, for uh, against news deserts, against the, the destruction of America's uh, and the world's newspapers, uh, uh, news media. And uh, uh, and she's going to be running a, uh, this next conversation about the promise and limits of philanthropy. And she's going to be working with, uh, conversing with two of the people who've really thought a lot about this. Uh, Steve Waldman, who's been a, a real friend to uh, uh, the Center for Journalism and Liberty here at Open Markets, and, and uh, who is the head of Report for America. And then uh, Millie Tran, who is... Uh, until recently was of the Texas Tribune. And I think Penny will give a little bit more detail about each of them. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Barry. The feeling is mutual uh, here, and I really have enjoyed uh, hearing the various perspectives today and, and the real focus on what's at stake here, as well as what the potential solutions are, both short-term and long-term. Um, I, I want to start by saying when I moved out of the business world into academia in uh, 2008, uh, when I accepted the position at, uh, as night chair at UNC, everyone asked me, um, you know, surely it's got to be a nonprofit model for news. Um, it kind of, uh, the assumption then was nonprofit was going to support uh, both the New York Times as well as digital startups. In the beginning, it has mostly uh, 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 supported um, entrepreneurship, but as things have gotten uh, tougher and tougher for legacy media like newspapers, uh, you've seen uh, major organizations like the Seattle Times as well as the the New York Times set up uh, philanthropic uh, uh, arms that go after particular uh, foundation money, specifically grants that will help them cover uh, communities. Uh, I think that one of the issues that has con continued to uh, perplex me is there's kind of a math problem uh, with uh, looking at uh, philanthro philanth philanthro philanthropic uh, organizations to basically and individuals uh, to fill this. And it was um, uh, put together quite nicely back in the middle part of the last decade when the Chornstein tracked how much money was actually going to news organizations. Uh, it was a minuscule amount of the billions, uh, I think it was less than two billion of the tens of billions that had been lost at that point by uh, news organizations in terms of revenue. Uh, but what was even more uh, concerning was how small of the amount of money state and regional news organizations were receiving from all of that. Uh, the Knight Foundation has done a, a, a wonderful job since then of, of trying to highlight the importance of uh, what has, uh, how, how important giving to local foundations is, but we still face a um, uh, a tremendous uh, hurdle in terms of trying to turn around the battleship. Uh, and there's another uh, limit that uh, Latrell mentioned in an earlier uh, uh, panel discussion, which has to do with the amount of money uh, that is philanthropic money that is concentrated in this country, concentrated in both large cities and concentrated in affluent areas. So you know, the typical nonprofit um, digital startup, according to the Institute of Nonprofit News, relies on at least 60 to 80% of their annual revenue coming in from either uh, 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 
donors, uh, let's say generous, wealthy donors or foundations, either community foundations or, um, or, or uh, uh, family foundations. The result is that, you know, if we don't solve the philanthropic problem at the same time we're solving the business problem on the for-profit side, as Latrell said, we just end up duplicating again and solving the problem that we already have without really looking at the how we expand coverage and representation in underserved and economically struggling communities. So I want to start by talking with Steve Wallman, who was the author of the uh, 2011 uh, Federal Communications uh, Commission report, uh, the information needs of communities. And Steve, what, I'm curious as to how your own notion of, uh, of uh, philanthropy has changed over the last decade, uh, of the importance that it plays in our, our news environment and what needs to be, what the promise and the, the limits are. Thank, thank you, Penny. Um, before I answer that, I hope you don't mind if I take just a one minute digression to just set a bit of context in response to what we've heard so far that the, the efforts to, uh, to try to deal with the antitrust issues are really important. But from what I've seen of the, the Klobuchar and Cicilline bills, they would not actually save local news. Uh, they, they may improve the legislation and there are all sorts of benefits to it. But right now, my sense is that it wouldn't necessarily help the smaller players and that the legislation really needs to be kind of uh, revised to make sure it does. And that we also need to look at other public policy steps that would more directly help local news. So let's, uh, sorry about that, but I had to, <laughs> had to get that off my chest. In terms of the philanthropy, um, you know, it's this weird moment that we're in now because the consequences of the collapse of local news are catastrophic. I mean, it's just, it's hard to overstate how severe a threat this is to democracy. And yet in financial terms, this is actually very solvable. You know, you go, if you go to conferences uh, on climate change or healthcare or something like that, there will invariably be someone who says, well, philanthropy should play an important role, but to be sure it can't solve the whole problem. It can only, you know, finance innovation. In this case, actually, Philanthropy could solve the whole problem. I mean, I'm not saying that's the best way to do it, but just to give you a sense of scale, it would take about one to $2 billion of new money properly targeted in local news to really, it would double the number of local reporters. That would be about a half of 1% of current philanthropic giving. So if there was a slight shift on the part of foundations and the 750 community foundations or individuals, in the direction of viewing local journalism as an important part of their community's health, that actually would make it would be transformative. As you said, right now that's not happening on the scale it needs to. And by the way, the tech, the tech, you know, tech wealth is part of the issue. It's like the winners of the new of the digital economy should be the the playing lead roles philanthropically as well. So I think that the even though there are real limitations to the role of philanthropy, like the ones you talked about, you, uh, editorial independence uh, issues, I'm actually kind of optimistic, or at least I've come to the view that philanthropy with a relatively model, modest shift in perception and behavior could largely solve this problem. And I think one key thing is that people have to stop thinking of philanthropy, especially local philanthropy as a kind of lightning bolt from the sky thing uh, and start thinking of it as the third revenue stream. And I say third revenue stream because no nonprofit is gonna make it unless they're also doing you know, sponsorships or events or, or uh, subscriptions. But I also encourage people to think of it as a revenue stream, that meaning it can be persistent, it can be recurring, it can be predictable, especially if you're not just relying on a couple wealthy individuals, but actually building out small donor bases. Because the you know a small donor to a a small recurring uh, donor to a nonprofit 
is a whole lot like a subscriber to a newspaper. Uh, it's a very similar form of recurring revenue. So I, I am really um, encouraged by what we've seen at Report for America by the role that philanthropy has played so far in helping to stand up a few hundred local nonprofit news organizations, but they're gonna have to go much farther if, we're, if they're gonna really have the impact they need to. So Steve, could you uh, just very briefly talk about um, the, the philanthropic model you've had at, uh, at Report for America, where you think what you think you've accomplished and where you hope to take it? Well, we, our model starts off with a kind of cost sharing premise. So we pay, Report for America pays half the salary and we ask the local newsrooms to pay the other half. And we basically have asked the newsrooms to raise half of their half from the community. And honestly, initially, we just kind of assumed they would do that, and we didn't really help very much. But in the last couple of years, we've, we've deployed a, a team of what we call sustainability coaches to work with the local newsrooms and found that relatively small interventions have had a pretty big impact. So uh, our news, almost all of our newsrooms have succeeded at raising the local share from their communities. And the goal is to make it sustainable. Increasingly, you're seeing uh, local community foundations set up essentially community chests or endowments or trust funds to make community support more permanent. We've had a 61% increase this year in the average amount of the new, what the newsrooms raised for themselves from, from these communities. Now, one interesting thing that's a bit surprising is we tend to think of the world as being nonprofits and for-profits. And what we often see is the development of kind of a hybrid that is a for-profit entity that is working with an institution like Report for America to raise money philanthropically. And what happens is it's not just like a cash pass-through mechanism. When you inject nonprofit money and spirit and rules inside a for-profit newsroom, it changes the for-profit newsroom. It both forces and allows them to focus their beats onto communities like communities of color or lower income communities that they had been ignoring and rationalizing as, oh, well, the business model doesn't sustain this. It enables and requires them to cover those communities better. And that leads to ultimately better business models as well as better coverage. Uh, so uh, thanks, Steve. Um, Millie, uh, you've had experience at both the New York Times and um, uh, more recently at the Texas Tribune. The Texas Tribune is often the model that we've heard cited for at least a decade as having gotten the mix kind of right. Uh, talk to us about what uh, philanthropic uh, donations, giving uh, uh, revenue means to the, uh, the Texas Tribune, what, where, what, I, what you think it has enabled and, um, and where it stands today uh, versus other uh, similar regional nonprofits as well, we would call them. Thanks, Penny. Um, before I get into that, I wanted to share kind of three points to contextualize this answer and will kind of help um, kind of expose the kind of larger trends of what I'm seeing Texas Tribune kind of plays into. Um, and I should say, I'm no longer with the Texas Tribune. My last day was Friday. Terry Quinn is our amazing chief development officer. So she'll kind of have all of these nitty gritty details. Um, I'd love to speak about these larger trends though. So kind of three things struck me, right? So journalism focused philanthropy has nearly quadrupled since 2009. I was surprised by that. And that's according to the Media Impact Funders latest report. Um, two, foundation support is increasing, but becoming a smaller percentage of overall revenue, thanks to, you know, other kind of revenue streams like Stephen talked about. So there's membership programs, events, sponsorships. Um, and I think all of these are kind of signs toward publishers, specifically nonprofit news organizations, kind of shifting to kind of creating more of that direct um, relationship with their audiences, right? So we're seeing more um, news organizations with diversifying revenue streams. Um, I think it was uh, the Institute for Nonprofit News surveyed its members and found that for the first time, a slight majority of nonprofits say that foundation grants accounted for less than half of their annual revenue, which I thought was really interesting, right? It, again, it's like that third revenue stream that you were talking about, Stephen, and 
how do we build this in a sustainable way? Um, what was interesting to me and what's kind of uh, replacing that or supporting it are these like new membership programs. So a lot of these membership programs at news organizations um, are growing. Many of them are less than three years old, but they're becoming a larger percentage of many of these news organizations kind of operating um, costs and business and therefore revenue as well. Um, and finally, the third point, I wanna go back to my days at the American Press Institute. Um, we did this report in 2017 about who pays for news and why. And I'm sure both of these numbers are higher now, but in 2017, um, more than half, so 53% of adults paid for some sort of news subscription. Um, and while you know older Americans were most likely to pay for news, um, about four in 10 of the youngest adults, so that's that 18 to 34 cohort in America paid for news. So there, there are all these kind of macro trends about more people paying for news, younger people paying for news. Um, and what was interesting, interesting to me with that was that you know, of the reasons people gave for why they chose to pay for news, it was that um, the, third, the third highest reason was, um, I feel good about contributing to the news organization. So there's this, there's this um, macro trend of more people paying for news, supporting news organizations, in addition to these um, increasing philanthropic support, which I think is really interesting. Um, and I actually lied, I have a final point, which I'm sure Stephen will um, be able to speak to more, but Stephen, um, I know that Report for America recently surveyed its news partners and found that individual donors like made up nearly half of the money earned. And the vast majority of those were a small dollar donations, so less than a hundred. Um, so I think that's really interesting. And I think like all of those trends also contribute and inform what we were doing at the Texas Tribune, right? So I directly oversaw the membership program. And even though it was kind of an anomaly for us this last year, but if you're looking at the 2019 to 2020 uh, figures, Membership was a lower percentage of our overall revenue that year or in, in those two years compared, um, but membership was a higher uh, raw number. So we got much more um, membership dollars in this past year as more people were kind of reading us more depending on us for coronavirus coverage um, and kind of coverage of the election. So th those to me make me optimistic too. Um, I'm surprised that you have two optimistic people on this panel, um, but there it is. <laughs> Got it. Um, let me go back and, and pose for both of you. Uh, while it's encouraging to see all these signs, uh, I think that we still get back to the notion that uh, there is a huge disparity in the way philanthropic funds are concentrated in, in this country. Uh, Stephen, you mentioned that um, you, know, you, you had had to go in and actually work and provide workshops and show how to do it. I mean, it's not, it's not an intuitive thing. Uh, it's also something that can be more labor intensive as, as Millie and I talked about and actually going out and selling advertising our uh, sponsorships. Uh, there are things that you have to uh, not only apply for, work through and, um, but also track going forward. It depends on the various news organizations. Um, I remain very concerned that while it, it, there's good news for you and uh, Millie and for Steve at, you know, in what you're doing, what is the promise here of, of, of philanthropy and how do we go about getting philanthropy to branch out beyond what's already established and think in the same way uh, Latrell is thinking about how do you, how do you use philanthropy to uh, build up coverage of underserved and economically struggling communities, which, by the way, are the ones most likely to have lost a news outlet that might have covered at least some of the important issues they had in the past. Well, you know, the, the, the stat that Millie mentioned, the quadrupling of uh, philanthropic support for, for journalism, most of that didn't go to local. You know, it went to national and journalism schools and public media and things like that. So there was an increase in local, but not enough, not enough of it. So the first thing is that the philanthropic community has to understand the importance of local news. 
that it's essential to their to their own health. And you know, honestly, it's understandable why they haven't yet. I mean, until very recently, they were perfectly healthy commercial models. So it takes a little while to shift, but the house is on fire right now. And the philanthropic community has to really wake up to the fact that, that community journalism is not going to survive without the support of the community. And that means civic support beyond not just subscriptions and advertising that just has to happen. And it has to happen quickly. Now on the economic disparity issues, um, one encouraging thing that we found was that in our in our cohort of, of newsrooms, the newsrooms in lower income communities were just as successful at raising the, the local philanthropic share as the ones in more affluent communities. Now, I don't want to overstate that. If you take that to a large scale, it probably would start to erode. But I think it just shows that, first of all, the amount of money you need to support journalism on a local level is actually not that much. And that people really understand in, in lower income communities how important it is. But the, the philanthropic sector has to look at statewide ecosystems and do a bit of redistribution of wealth, honestly. I mean, there are 750 community foundations. So it's not only wealthy areas that have philanthropy, but on a state level, the philanthropic players do have an obligation to make sure that it's not only the communities of wealth that end up with philanthropic support. Great. Um, Millie, uh, if you would talk about it from a, uh, the perspective of Texas itself, some of the initial steps that the Texas Tribune has done, because I think that Steve raises an interesting uh, point, which is that, you know, given the fact that we've got to turn things around, uh, given the fact that, quite frankly, many of these community foundations as well as family foundations have a majority already designated uh, as much as 95% of their income is designated for another purpose. So you, it takes a while to work through that. So let's assume there's a limited amount. You want to put the uh, philanthropy in the places where it can work the best. Uh, back to Steve's point, maybe it's about thinking about philanthropy on a statewide basis uh, and uh, how you cover underserved communities. Yeah, I, one thing I wanted to say was that, you know, a lot of the, um, like your research around these deserts, Penny, like some of those communities weren't covered in the first place or had news services or news organizations covering them in the first place. So I think there are a lot of assumptions about kind of what, what went away versus what never existed. Um, but to your question about kind of statewide um, organization, you know, one thing I continue to fully support and wish more organizations did, um, which is the Texas Tribune allows any publisher to republish its journalism. So there's kind of this positive feedback loop and kind of an additive to the information ecosystem when the Texas Tribune does good local reporting, it's shared across the state or can be shared across the state. Um, I remember getting a note from a um, smaller publisher in Texas who said that because we cover the state so well, it allowed them to cover their local community and focus on their local community. So I think they're, you know, I, I believe in a more collaborative um, ecosystem. I think that's kind of the uh, magic in this. Um, I, you know, an example that we talked about yesterday too um, was about the Dallas Morning News. Um, in our election coverage in November, they featured our election results on their homepage. And I think that level and kind of intensity and complexity of collaboration was kind of unheard of before, right? So I really think there is benefit to kind of statewide in supporting kind of information needs to allow local publishers to focus on their own, but still being additive versus um, extractive. So, so um, Millie, at the moment, uh, what would you say the percentage is of um, of revenue that comes into the Texas Tribune if you count both memberships and individual donors who are giving more than, uh, not, not your membership uh, folks, but your individual donors? So um, in 2019, this is in the Texas Tribune's annual report, 49% um, of revenue was from major gifts. So that's um, foundations and individuals. In 2020's annual report, 56% um, was from major gifts. Um, and like I said, 
the percentage of membership went down as a percentage of total revenue, but it actually went up in terms of raw numbers. So in 2010 or 2019, that was 10%. And in 2020, it was 8%. So you're, you're seeing a pretty stable mix. Um, and I think as we kind of built more infrastructure to support um, those other revenue lines, you'll see that mix kind of balance out and truly be kind of that third line of revenue that um, Steve mentioned, Stephen mentioned. And you've also been, uh, uh, over the past decade, been pretty um, diligent about trying to build out other revenue streams, including sponsorships and uh, and membership type of. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, you know, that's, that's what's expensive, right? That infrastructure and capacity to even do those things are expensive. Um, reporting is relatively easy and straightforward to set up, right? Reporting and editing. It's kind of all that other infrastructure um, uh, making the news, um, like literally putting it online or doing whatever it is with it, um, getting it out there and kind of learning from that and do it, repeating it, right? Um, so it, it's the tech infrastructure, it's the design infrastructure, it's the marketing infrastructure, it's the membership infrastructure, um, all of those things support this. So it doesn't feel to me simple. Um, it feels possible, but um, definitely not simple or straightforward. Steve, I, yeah, I want to flip back to you and, and let you kind of um, talk a little bit about what you've been thinking about on policy side that would encourage more philanthropy uh, going forward. Uh, one of the things that was disappointing to me is looking at uh, specifically what had happened to uh, digital sites that had started up. So in addition to tracking newspapers, we tracked ethnic media, we tracked public broadcasting, we've tracked... Um, uh, digital sites. And between 2018 and 2019, uh, 20, we basically added as many digital sites as we lost. Now, the, the interesting part is nonprofit digital sites tend to be more enduring. Uh, that's probably because they do not launch until they have some kind of commitment from a foundation or an individual donor. Uh, but they still face many of the same issues that uh, legacy media face in terms of uh, where they're going to get their revenue. So uh, talk to us briefly about a couple or three of your proposals that might encourage more uh, philanthropic giving on either an individual or organizational level. Well, one idea that I think is really intriguing is a, a $250 refundable tax credit that people could use to either buy a local news subscription to a commercial or to make a donation to a a local news nonprofit. It's, it's spiritually similar to the charitable deduction in that it's not a government agency deciding where the money goes. It's a consumer makes a choice and the government then enhances that consumer power. It's, it's more than a deduction because it's a refundable credit. It's almost like a voucher. And that could have a really transformative effect in the nonprofit sector. Now, it has a kind of market element to it, which I like, which is They've got to raise their hands and prove to the community that they're worth it, but that's appropriate. And if they do, it's very future friendly. It would, it could easily shift to a new thing. It could be um, really marketed in, the, in a nonprofit campaign. So that's one thing. Another thing I think the government could do is you're, you're all probably familiar with Newsmatch. This is a, a, a kind of straightforward idea that, that a bunch of foundations, the Knight Foundation and others created that basically said, whatever you all raise for yourselves from the community, we'll match it. So again, it's not them deciding which projects will get, but it's amplifying the choices of the and the buying power of consumers. The problem is news match is too small. Like you, you go through all the trouble and you max out and you get like $20,000. Well, imagine if that was $200,000 instead of $20,000 or, or $500,000. Then you're actually changing the game. Now, the federal government could do that. They could write a big check, drop it in Newsmatch, and overnight, the economics of local nonprofit news would change. And then the third idea I would mention has to do with replanting. Um, my wife thinks it's very funny that I coined the phrase replanting since I've never planted anything. But the idea is to take the, um, uh, not only look at startups, but there are 6,700 newspapers, as you mentioned, Penny, and some of them could actually still serve their communities very well if they had a different ownership structure and if they had different financing. So the idea would be to take, if tax, do tax policy changes that would incentivize 
the replanting of commercial newspapers into nonprofit entities in the community. For instance, you could give a tax incentive to the seller. If you sell your newspaper to a nonprofit entity, it's a tax-free transaction. You could even give more than that. Or to a nonprofit, if you as a nonprofit entity acquire a newspaper and, and commit to having it serve the community, we will give you say a $50,000 per head payroll tax credit for every journalist. That could be a lot of money and it could help finance the nonprofits acquiring these newspapers. So I think, you know, obviously startups are really important, but we sometimes only talk about startups. And I think there's a, a whole other track that has to do with the transformation and replanting of existing newspapers into new ownership structures, nonprofit collectives, things like that. I, I think that last one is very interesting when you consider the number of newspapers that have shuttered uh, and closed their doors in recent years simply because they couldn't find a buyer uh, for any of that. And uh, uh, some of your ideas there on how you value that property, uh, not based on uh, the current value, but on what it has meant historically is, is quite interesting. Uh, we're coming up to, to kind of round this up. I mean, I would like to... Um, for both of you to focus, and Millie, I'll go with you next. If you could wave your magic wand, what would you like to see uh, for uh, that would change? What is the promise of philanthropy that you would like to see over the next five to 10 years? Wow, five to 10 years. Um, I like can barely think about <laughs> next month. Um, you know, I, I love that Philanthropic support comes with impact, right? I think that focus on impact, the justification of impact, the tracking of impact is really important. Um, I would love to see more standardization there in terms of how to track it. We've talked about how there's kind of hidden cost in like applying to these grants because they all ask for a million different things, which actually puts the onus on the news organization to track those diligently versus um, you know, focus on the journalism. So I, I, I don't know how to solve that particular problem, but ever since we um, started talking about it, that's, I, I would love a way to kind of figure that part out. Great, thanks. Steven, you get the last word. Well, I think this is gonna need to be a combination of a change of mindset on the philanthropic side. Every community foundation should view local journalism as a critical element of their community's health. Every foundation, whether if they're, you're an education funder, you know, put in a, another billion dollars into school reform and see how that goes if there's no one covering the local schools. Like they need to really be supporting local journalism as well. And that if there is that mindset shift in the philanthropic world, we really can tackle this problem. And I would say that in addition to that, we, we do in fact need smart public policies that, uh, that are neutral and don't involve the government giving out grants to favored news organizations that really do preserve editorial independence. But, uh, but those kinds of government policies, including antitrust, need to be part of the solution as well. Well, uh, thank you guys both for uh, the, the, your insights and for the time you've spent on the panel. Um, I think that as we look at things, there are, there are various arms to how we need to approach uh, uh, the crisis that we're in right now with the lack of local news. And philanthropy has to be part of that problem. It is, uh, Stephen, as you say, the, uh, the changing the mindset uh, is a really important uh, uh, first step. Uh, but it's also, it's also one that we, we have to say, you know, we can't just wait for uh, you know, the, uh, for the mindset to change is how do we start doing that at the community level, starting on an individual level. Uh, so for, uh, for me, it has been about as much speaking to uh, community civic minded people on the ground as it is about speaking to policymakers, because you, uh, it is about understanding what's at stake as well as understanding what you can do personally uh, from all of that. Uh, Barry, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thank you, Penny, and uh, thank you, uh, Millie and Stephen. It was a, a really great conversation, and 
you know, I think there's a, it actually lived up exactly to its title, which is both the promise and the limits of philanthropy. And uh, it's, you know, um, as uh, someone who, you know, has lived in the world of advertising and who, who has lived in the world of, of philanthropy, I absolutely see how they can fit together in ways that uh, really help us rebuild our free press in the way that we need to rebuild it. Um, so we actually we have, uh, right now we're going to be going to a keynote speech by Congressman Cicilline. Um, and then we're going to be going to a, a short break. Um, now, one thing about this keynote speech that we, until yesterday afternoon, this speech was supposed to be live. Uh, what happened yesterday afternoon is that uh, Congressman Cicilline learned that uh, they, he had to be uh, sitting in the, um, the uh, committee room for the Judiciary Committee because there was a series of votes. And because of the way that Congress has been functioning recently, it's impossible to actually step out of that committee room uh, because you may actually lose a vote. Uh, because of the, uh, So the way Congress has been functioning has been somewhat uh, uh, sort of turned upside down. Uh, so instead of actually going, you know, having this go live, we did have uh, Senate, uh, uh, Congressman Cicilline, uh recorded this last evening about 6 p.m. Uh, now, so it's a very fresh take. Uh, we like to present our uh, uh, a live uh, event, but uh, this is about as close as live as we can get. He actually has Senator, I mean, uh, Congressman Cicilline, uh actually looking, uh, among other things, at uh, Dan Frumpkin's article in the Washington Monthly that came out yesterday. Uh, so um, I just, uh, I will do a quick uh, in sort of description of uh, Congressman Cicilline's uh, background. And then also I'm gonna do a quick little talk about Sarah Fisher, who was supposed to do a Q and A with, uh, uh, with uh, Congressman Cicilline. So Congressman Cicilline, he, uh, he's from Rhode Island's first congressional district. Uh, and he took office in uh, 2011 uh, after the election of 2010, uh, you know, he's, been running the antitrust subcommittee and, and he and his staff uh, have really transformed the conversation in the United States about competition policy, about the uh, monopoly problem, about what we can do about this. You know, and I, and I emphasize the Congressman Cicilline's staff because he has really empowered some really uh, sort of uh, uh, a terrific crew of, of new leaders. This includes Lena Khan who, as was mentioned earlier, uh, will be uh, coming up for um, uh, confirmation tomorrow in the Senate hearing uh, for her new role as a, as a uh, <clears throat> commissioner on the FTC. It also includes our, 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 our dear friends, Slade Baum, who uh, has been working with the uh, Congressman for a long time. Uh, importantly, Congressman Cicilline is uh, one of the prime supporters and has been a prime supporter of the Journalism Competition and Preservation Act, along with Senator Klobuchar and with uh, Republican uh, Congressman Ken Buck. Back in March, when he introduced that bill, Congressman Cicilline said a strong, diverse, free press is critical for any successful democracy Access to trustworthy local journalism informs the public. It helps to hold powerful people accountable and roots out corruption. Unfortunately, we're not able to bring in Sarah Fisher today because Congressman Cicilline is not a part of this, but Sarah Fisher, we were very much looking forward to have her take part. She's the media reporter for Axios. Uh, she joined that company in 2016 as a founding staff member. She's one of the really top reporters on her beat in this town. Uh, she is uh, someone that we've known and worked with for a long time. We are great admirers of Sarah and we look forward to working with her soon. But I'm gonna turn it over to the producers who are going to connect us to uh, Congressman Cicilline's uh, uh, speech. And then we're going to go to a break uh, immediately after that, that will last for until uh, about three o'clock. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me at today's important event on the future of journalism and democracy. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Barry Lynn, as well as his team at the Center for Journalism and Liberty at the Open Markets Institute for their leadership on this issue. 
It's also a pleasure to join my friend and co-lead on the Journalism Competition and Preservation Act, Senator Amy Klobuchar, at today's event. Make no mistake, journalism is in an absolute state of crisis. Over the past 15 years, one in five newspapers closed, and the number of journalists working for newspapers has been cut in half. Between 2004 and 2019, America reportedly lost approximately 2,100 newspapers. Newspapers across the country are laying off reporters and editorial staff or folding altogether. The majority of counties in America are down to just a single publisher of local news, and many lack a local news option altogether. Today, at least 200 counties have no local newspaper at all. As Jonathan Schluss, the president of News Guild, recently testified before my subcommittee, and I quote, we are truly facing an extinction level event for local news, end quote. We also know this is not only happening to local publishers or news broadcasters, it's happening to digital news publishers as well. Earlier this year, in the wake of its acquisition of BuzzFeed, the Huffington Post laid off dozens of journalists due to declining advertising revenue. Unfortunately, they are not alone. Last year, digital publishers furloughed or laid off dozens of reporters and other newsroom staff. These layoffs occur at a time when more people are online than ever before, and online readership is at an all-time high. This decline has also accelerated, been accelerated in the wake of the pandemic. We're rapidly losing reporters and local sources of news at a time when local journalism is more important than ever. At today, as today's event has made clear, the crisis in American journalism is also a very real crisis in our democracy and civic life. When local news sources disappear, corruption rises, and local government spending and borrowing costs go up. As several economists have documented, when a community's local newspaper shuts down, its municipal borrowing costs increase significantly. The Federal Communications Commission has similarly found that the decline of journalism locally contributes, and I quote, to more government waste, more local corruption, less effective schools, and other serious community problems, end quote. There is no question that the rise of local news deserts has also contributed to the spread of misinformation online. Without a trustworthy source for local news, Americans are turning to Facebook, YouTube, and other social media sources where misinformation is rampant. As the events leading up to the violent mob's attack on the Capitol on January 6th have made clear, the stakes are extremely high. Our country will not survive if we do not operate with a set of shared facts, if corruption is not exposed and rooted out at all levels of government, and if power is not held to account. Whether it's an online publisher, national newspaper, or local broadcaster, we cannot have a democracy without a free and diverse press. In response to these concerns, last Congress, the subcommittee examined the effect of market power of the largest technology platforms on the survival of a free and diverse press as part of our bipartisan investigation. During our inquiry, we received evidence about the significant and growing asymmetry of power between several dominant online platforms and news publishers. In numerous interviews, submissions, and testimony before the subcommittee, publishers and broadcasters with distinct business models and distribution strategies said they are increasingly beholden to Google and Facebook which increasingly function as the gatekeepers for information online. For example, Digital Content Next, which represents digital news publishers and content companies, notes in a statement for the record for today's hearing that 64% of online referrals to its premium publishers came from services owned by Facebook or Google, underscoring the extraordinary role of these companies in how the public discovers, searches, and spreads information. According to the Pew Research Center, nearly three quarters of Americans get their news online through either Facebook or Google. As news publishers have noted, this gatekeeper power gives Facebook and Google the ability to distort the flow of information online. This means that Google and Facebook can divert their billions of users away from trustworthy sources of news with a single change to their algorithms or through other subtle but meaningful ways, such as manipulating ad auctions. A second related problem that we identified during the investigation is the market power of these firms over digital advertising. Facebook and Google control the majority of the online advertising market in the United States and have captured nearly all of the growth in this market. 
every year, advertisers pay billions of dollars to these two companies to serve highly targeted ads on Facebook and through Google's advertising network. Nearly a dozen Republican state attorneys general who are currently suing Google for monopolization described Google's advertising network as the, and I quote, largest electronic trading market in existence, end quote. These companies continue to enjoy persistently high profit margins, a telltale sign of their substantial and enduring market power. At the same time, news publishers have seen a steep decline in revenue and a reduced ability to monetize journalism, particularly when it comes to these sources online. Overall, the market power of Google and Facebook is reinforced by the unprecedented amount of data collected by these companies, along with other factors that have tipped digital markets in favor of these firms and blocked rivals and new entrants from challenging their dominance. In response to this urgent problem, I reintroduced the Journalism Competition and Preservation Act earlier this year. My legislation would allow news publishers and broadcasters to collectively negotiate with dominant platforms to improve the quality, accuracy, attribution, and functioning of news online. While I do not view this legislation as a substitute for more meaningful competition online, including structural remedies to address the underlying problems in the market, it is clear that we must do something in the short term to save trustworthy journalism before it's lost forever. In the absence of a competitive marketplace or congressional action, there will continue to be mass, mass consolidation and widespread layoffs. What's more, we will continue to see Facebook and Google hold tremendous sway over journalism through their monopoly power over digital advertising and their role as gatekeepers online. This point was underscored by Dan Frumkin, who in an article published yesterday in the Washington Monthly about how Facebook is selectively funneling money to major news publishers as part of its Facebook News program. As he noted, this is a secretive, multi-million dollar a year payout scheme aimed at the most influential news outlets in America, raising serious concerns about conflicts of interest while undermining the same local news organizations that are in the most desperate need for help. In closing, I wanna leave you with a positive note, and that is that Americans have had enough. By an overwhelming basis, Republicans and Democrats agree that these companies have too much power and that Congress must curb this dominance. We've begun the hard work of outlining policies to adopt many of the recommendations we identified on our report last Congress. Over the next several months, we will introduce a series of bills to address these concerns. Mark my words, change is coming. Laws are coming, both in the United States and abroad. With that, I wanna thank the Open Markets Institute again for having me. Well, there you have it, everybody. We have a promise from Chairman Cicilline. Change is coming. So uh, when, what we also what we have coming are just two more panels, about an hour and a half more of our uh, conversation. And we look forward to seeing you all shortly, starting in again in about uh, 16 minutes.
everybody. Welcome back. It's uh, we just have the last part of our very long day of discussions ahead of us, and uh, uh, I think we're going. This next conversation is going to be one of the liveliest, I suspect. And uh, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Paul Glastris, who's going to actually introduce this next uh, uh, panel. Uh, and uh, Paul is the sort of the person who has kept the Washington Monthly alive for the past 20 years. Uh, Paul is a dear friend. He's one of the true uh, uh, heroes of American journalism. Uh, uh, I, I'd say there's, there's probably no publication in American history that you know, sort of pound for pound has punched with more power. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the Washington Monthly has you know, really, you know, as a partner to us here at uh, Open Markets, uh, has you know, from our point of view, has has been the 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 the, the backbone of, of of this fight against concentrated power uh, for the last eleven years. We've been working very closely with the monthly and with Paul. Uh, so Paul, you know, as I said, Paul's a friend. Uh, he's somebody uh, I have debated with uh, time and again. Uh, we have had loud debates, uh, but uh, every single debate has ended up coming back uh, to, to a hug. And, uh, and I'm sure that after COVID, we'll be hugging again and debating again. Uh, so anyway, Paul Glasters. Barry, thank you so much for the kind words. Um, I'm just so grateful to you and your whole team at Open Markets Institute and the Center for Journalism and Liberty for so many years of partnership uh, going back 11 years ago to the great piece that you and Phil Longman did, Who Broke America's Jobs Machine based on your book Cornered, which really did break open this whole uh, tomb of riches of anti-monopoly. And we've been mining it together ever since. And it's now become uh, just a giant movement and your, your vision and leadership's been, you know, just immensely important in all that. So thank you uh, for this. Um, going back a decade before that, almost two decades ago, the Washington Monthly, like so many publications, invested heavily in transforming our website in part to garner digital advertising. And for years it worked uh, beautifully. And then the prices of our digital ads plummeted and it really was a tough burden on us. And it took us a while to fully realize the reason behind the decline. And that is that Facebook and Google were in the process of monopolizing digital ad revenue. In part because of this experience, we uh, devoted an entire issue of the print magazine, you know, in partnership with you all uh, and with sponsorship from the Knight Foundation uh, uh, to explore the role of platform monopolies in undermining the business model of journalism and what can be done about it. One of the stories in that issue by, by University of Illinois professor uh, Dr. Nikki Usher revealed that Google and Facebook have become uh, the two largest sources of donations for for-profit and non-profit journalism in the United States. Um, Usher also showed how frustratingly hard it is to track the money because of a lack of disclosure and the complicated ways the funding flows and why individual press outlets, many of which are struggling to stay alive, might not want to be totally diligent in digging in to the broader story of these huge donations. So um, yesterday, again, in partnership with the Center uh, for Journalism and Liberty, the Washington Monthly followed up with a major investigation by Dan Frumkin, veteran Washington journalist and editor of uh, Press Watch, uh, into one important part of the overall story, how Facebook has been funneling millions of dollars to the New York Times and other major news outlets under the cover of launching a little known feature called Face News. You heard Congressman Cicilline talk about that story. It's getting um, quite a bit of play. While the exact terms of these deals remain secret, the Wall Street Journal had previously reported that each agreement was worth about $3 million. But in an exclusive interview with Frumkin, uh, former New York Times CEO Mark Thompson said that the Times is getting, quote, far, far more than $3 million a year. Now, as someone who works every day to keep a journalistic enterprise financially viable uh, in these difficult times, I know the decisions on whether publishers can remain independent while taking money from the very behemoths that are destroying our industry's business model is not an easy one, um, especially since 
many of these outlets are doing superlative work under tough conditions. But it is a question that not only those of us in journalism, but anyone who cares about the future of the press and democracy has to wrestle with honestly. Um, so I am eager, and, and I hope you are in the audience, to hear the debate that's about to happen uh, among five media professionals and scholars who have been on the cutting edge of the digital revolution and have thought through long and hard uh, on this, this question. In addition to Nikki Usher and Dan Frumkin, the authors of the two Washington Monthly stories I, I just mentioned, our panelists include um, Mandy Jenkins, former general manager of McClatchy's Compass Experiment in Youngstown, Ohio, Ben Smith, a medium media columnist for the New York Times and the former editor-in-chief of BuzzFeed, and Rana Furara, Rana, I'm messing, messing your name, you'll, you'll okay. correct me. Ur uh, Uruhar. Uruhar, thank you. I practiced it and then muffed it again. She is a columnist, well-known columnist and editor at the Financial Times. Um, and so uh, I think that uh, Nikki, you'll be you'll be moderating this. So over to you and thanks, Barry. Thanks so much and welcome everybody. And thanks for staying with us. Um, so I guess I just wanted to make one thing clear before setting out some questions for you all, which is that these are not donations, right? There is nothing philanthropic about this Google and Facebook money. It is not coming through a 501c3. It is not coming through a foundation. In fact, it's coming from marketing budgets. So we need to be really clear because while these companies use terms like grant and donation, right? These are not grants and donations. And it's also really important to know that sometimes the money promised isn't even real money. So when Facebook announced $100 million to go towards COVID relief for newsrooms, 75 million of it was actually for ad credits so that struggling local news organizations could buy more ads on Facebook. So so just before we start that out, I guess you know where I'm coming from on this, but I kind of wanted to ask the, the group of people gathered here about what are, why, what are the motivations for Google and Facebook to give this money to begin with? Want to pick a panelist? <laughs> pick a panel? I don't know. I, I mean, I guess, Rana, you've done so much journalism about this. What's, what's the strategy play here? Well, um, it's an easy one. They're giant advertising firms <laughs> and they want content to be around so they can monetize it. Um, you know, I think you started with the right frame, which is that these are, these are the world's largest and most powerful companies like ever in the history of <laughs> capitalism. And um, they've done that with the well-known econ economics of platforms. Anybody that hasn't read Hal Varian's information rules, go read it. You'll see exactly what we're talking about. The chief economist of Google lays out why these companies have monopoly power, why they are natural monopolies. Um, and uh, you know they do this through highly targeted digital advertising, which is the vast majority of their revenues. So they need stuff to monetize. That's why they care about journalism. That's why they started the local journalism initiatives to begin with, because so many of those newspapers had been um, and, and, and sites have been decimated. And um, yeah, that's it's not it's not complicated. That's the deal. <laughs> I, I would actually say that that that. Rana, although your, your cynicism is, is entirely justified, I don't think you're being cynical enough um, because I think specifically what Facebook is doing in paying uh, for journalism right now has nothing to do with actually supporting journalism. It has nothing to do with actually giving money to the organizations that need it, that are going broke. It has nothing to do with supporting uh, the, the places that are doing some of the greatest work. It's for them, I think it is uh, a PR move. I think it is a, a, an attempt at a regulation avoidance and crisis communication. And, and you, you can see this by who they're giving the money to. I mean, I'll just back up for a minute and tell you my story. I've been doing online journalism since 1997 um, and you know, watched as Google and Facebook basically took over the, the advertising market that we thought was gonna support online journalism and watched in horror. And so of course, for a long time, a lot of us have been saying, well, they need to start paying 
for news. They need to start supporting this industry that they have basically, you know, are in the process of destroying. And so we were very happy, for instance, initially, or some of us, uh, to hear in 2019 that Facebook was starting up a new news tab and was going to pay uh, its marquee partners for content. Um, and we thought that was a great precedent, Facebook paying for news. But when I looked at the actual details of the deal and looked at how it's working and looked at how secretive the uh, people who are getting it money are, I realized that this was a, a very bad precedent. That uh, for one thing, you had Facebook choosing who to give money to uh, you know, for their own reasons and uh, not in any way that would make sense as far as fairness or as far as helping small struggling newspapers. Um, so the, 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 the partnerships with money went almost exclusively to large national news organizations with a lot of political clout, not a coincidence. Um, because, it's not a, because it's not an advertising purchase, it's really just a, a gift from the PR department. Um, it creates ethical issues that say if they bought ads wouldn't exist. Um, and then they demanded uh, secrecy from the organizations that took the money and so, so as to nobody would know what the details of the deal were, either in terms of uh, how much money they got or, or what strings were attached. So uh, I feel like, like Facebook's motives here are, are highly suspect. It's not just that they need news, they're trying to buy regulation avoidance. Yeah, I wonder, Mandy, I mean, you have such an unusual story of being sort of in the position of being part of the good guys, right? Google tries to set up, um, you know, Youngstown's without a newspaper, Google sweeps in, brings in somebody with authentic news chops, like, what happened? What What do you recommend? Is I mean, Dan talked about big places, but but Youngstown, Ohio, isn't a big place, and a you know, not it wasn't a big effort. So maybe you can contrast that a little bit. Oops, there we go. Um, so yeah, and you know, it is that it was a, a very local effort, and you know, obviously, like Google was partnering with McClatchy, which is a large newspaper company, so it isn't like they were just working with the site in Youngstown. Um, but you know, they did hand over a check of of some some size. I, I was not part of that negotiation, but you know, of being able to say, hey, we're going to go, we're going to start these new news organizations and places that need news, and this is how we want to study it. This is what we want to get out of it. And, you know, I do think, I do believe that part of it is that they want to understand a little bit better about the advertising market and the digital advertising market in markets that size. Um, I, I don't think they understand it because it's, you know, inside of like a tech product mindset, it's, it's scale at all costs and working at that kind of local level is not something they're necessarily used to. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it's a, it's a difficult Thing to translate because it isn't anything like the rest of what they do or anything like the rest of what they fund when you're working on a very very local product that's aimed at a very local audience and it's supposed to be responsive to that audience it doesn't necessarily jive from a a mission and technology and funding standpoint in the same way as how any of these platforms operate but especially even how they're used to working with much bigger outlets I don't know if I actually answered your question, but no, I, think I, mean, so. I think I think that works. I, I'm just, uh, you know, Ben, in your your new position as media columnist at the New York Times, you are responsible for giving us the broad view. And I suppose, you know, what what do you see as the major conflict? I suppose, or or the major opportunity when it comes to news organizations actually working in partnership with Facebook and Google you know, what are, what are the losses? What are the wins? So I, I, I hate to be like the Facebook apologist on this panel. And I would say, it's just like, you know, I'm, I'm it's perhaps the nature of the panel more than my own position, but also I do know a lot about this because I negotiated Buzzfeed's deal with Facebook in this, in this program. And I think Dan has made it sound somewhat more sinister than it is like these the wonderful, no strings attached ad deals that he praised. The numbers were also always secret and often had strings attached. Like any, 
anywhere you're getting your money for journalism, there's no clean money. There's always strings attached. You know, the Knight Foundation, which is funding this, works with Google all the time and has all sorts of agendas. I mean, it's just the nature of money. You know, that the, the person paying the piper, it's worth asking whether they're calling the tune always. Um, the and, and I think, you know, one of the things that I think Dan points out really clearly is it just is not a normal marketplace. And, and Facebook's deals with these publishers were not, you know, were not deals where the publishers were exercising like normal leverage in a marketplace with lots of buyers and lots of sellers in a normal negotiation. Um, but that said, I do think, and this is something that's like very uncomfortable for journalists to talk about, the publishers were exercising a different kind of leverage and particularly News Corp was just using its editorial pages, using Tucker Carlson's show to beat the hell out of the platforms. And I think the notion that Facebook was trying to pay protection money, you know, what will that is not at all strange to think, you know, is that a bribe? Is that extortion? I don't know, you decide. Then I think places like the New York Times and BuzzFeed where I was would like to, you know, didn't affect our coverage. Our hands are totally clean, but there's no denying that Rupert Murdoch is the first one over the wall here, is the one who caused this whole thing to happen. It's announced in an interview with his deputy, Robert Thompson, sort of licking his lips while Mark Zuckerberg, you know, hands over sacks of cash. Um, and I think, you know, you have this strange market where you have these kind of monopolists who are very politically vulnerable. And so publishers who, as News Corp is, are willing to use their own political power, which is the power to influence politics against Facebook and Google have a certain amount of leverage. And I think that's part of what you saw here. If I may, Ben, I think you make lots of really very good points. And uh, the issue of bribery versus extortion is a, is a, it's a fine, fine distinction in, in Washington. Um, I'm wondering though, for instance, when you were meeting with the Facebook News folks at BuzzFeed, how, I don't know how much you can say about that because they probably made you promise not to say, but how, at least tell me, how did you arrive at, you know, what was an equitable uh, figure? Um, there was, let's see, I mean, I think it was a, it was an estimate, I believe that they gave us roughly off of how much BuzzFeed was being consumed on Facebook, of which there was a lot. Um, they, but as you, but it was also very one-sided, like there weren't multiple buyers, they were doing their own math. We were sort of like, well, that feels like a decent value exchange. Like we do, feel, like at BuzzFeed, certainly, because we were free, we felt like, look, we're like contributing a ton to this ecosystem of reliable news that people are consuming on Facebook, where a lot of other places have paywalls. And in some sense are, you know, if you aren't, you know, if you're not a paying customer, sorry, no, no quality news for you. And so, you know, we felt, and so, but, but it's, and so I didn't, there, there were certainly never any kind of explicit or implicit, we expect this to affect your coverage stuff. That's, that said, does Facebook at some high level hope it'll improve their coverage? Of course. And I think the only nuance in that is that I do think that part of the reason that Facebook gets negative coverage, one of the parts is that journalists perceive accurately that it's destroying the news industry and that they think that's bad. And if Facebook is to some degree less destroying the news industry, journalists will probably think it's less bad. Like that's not, that's the non-corrupt slice of this. Rana, I think you had something that you wanted to jump off of uh, from well, Ben. You know, I was just thinking about some of the things that Ben was saying and also the fact that, you know, Murdoch was the first over the wall. And, you know, we all kind of knew that that was going to be the case. But I think that, that the big, when you really pull the lens back here, what, what strikes me as important is governments have not been able to regulate these platforms. So it come, they have not been able to set a clean and clear uh, set of rules um, in, in any country really uh, yet. Uh, so everybody's left to their own devices and that, that, you know, leaving it to the private sector and particularly individually without any kind of, you know, ability of the institutions to come together and collectively do this is just, it's such a losing proposition. And it really speaks to the fact that, I mean, forget about the Washington consensus, the Beijing consensus, we got the Facebook consensus here. I mean, this is, this is an era in which companies and countries are literally on the same playing field of power. And that should make every single person um, with power in Washington wake up and think about that. I think that it's worth talking a little bit about what Rana has called cognitive capture, which is uh, this idea that media media leaders are really sort of 
fascinated by Google and Facebook and intrigued and feel like they can't live with or without them. And I don't know, Ben, you led a media organization. Mandy, um, you worked with Google and I know that McClatchy really was fascinated by Google. And I'm wondering if maybe we can start with Mandy. You can tell me a little bit about kind of what's it like to be in a newsroom kind of looking at tech? Is there sort of a this relationship I just described or, you know? Um, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, from my experience, I mean, obviously I was running two very local newsrooms in this and we were not covering tech in any real way. And to some extent, like, I think that's exactly who should be getting funded. Uh, if someone's going to be getting uh, sacks of cash, then that's exactly who it ought to be. Um, but, you know, there is, and I would say maybe not even at my level or at the level of like my staff uh, at, the, at the two local sites, but, you know, journalism executives and particularly in product and particularly in advertising are absolutely fascinated by Google and Facebook and want to emulate them. And I think that that is, you know, what you see happening uh, when you're, when you have like these, you know, giant companies buying up a lot of newspapers and trying to, to scale and do it all with this, as cheaply as possible, taking cues from them, like how much user generated content can we get? How much can we reuse things? How many different ways can we repackage this and send it out and not make something new is like the, the name of the game in, in journalism in a lot of ways these days. Um, and that is very much borrowed from the scale and the money as what is happening uh, in big tech. And I mean, I'm glad that uh, at the local level, there's no way you could even imitate that. But uh, that's also the problem when there's that focus on scale at all costs, because that is, uh, that's very much how any tech platform would want to do it, is what can we stamp out to make all of these sites look exactly the same, have their content all be exactly the same, and preferably have it all be as generated as much as possible, not by humans, that would totally make sense from their standpoint, because that's a very cheap way to do it. Yeah, I think Mandy is totally right on, on this. And it's like hopeless. You're not going to beat Google and Facebook chasing scale either. I mean, you're going to, it's, it's like a fight you're definitely going to lose. Um, you know, I do think, I guess, and maybe this is more, I do think there's been sort of a realism about it recently. I think that the, for years there was this like romance with Facebook and Google, like they were doing something so magical and interesting and complicated. And people would go to these like fancy seminars they set put on to get lectured about how like, how cool and mysterious their technology was. And I think it was also something where they would sort of mystify regulators. And it's like, this is so complicated. Nobody could ever possibly understand it, much less regulate it. Like ultimately they're not that complicated businesses. They're advertising businesses. None of this stuff is particularly hard to explain. Um, and I think, and I do think that now there is much less sense of, wow, they're doing something so special that we can't do. This tech is so far out of reach. I mean, a lot of the, publishing software has just gotten a lot better over the last few years. You can, as a, you know, as an individual pay 10 bucks a month for pretty decent publishing software as a service in a way that was not, was not true before. And I think that, yeah, the sort of missed the great mysteries of tech have, are mo were mostly marketing nonsense and have mostly dissolved. I mean, the one exception to that, I think, is that Facebook's local, Facebook's advertising product is just extraordinarily good and that's the thing that people do have to reckon with like if you're a local like local advertisers aren't using facebook because they've been tricked by someone or because newspapers were offering something just as good there is i mean the level of targeting which which apple may be breaking to some degree this year um has like is a real competitive advantage i could pick I can... up on something rana said uh, about government interaction government action here and I'm wondering, I mean, I think, I think all of us would support this notion of Facebook and Google somehow uh, their money being transferred back to the journalism industry. Um, but the, the issue then is, is how is that controlled? I was wondering, I wanted to ask Nikki, you know, obviously Facebook and Google are huge funders of nonprofit journalism as well. Is, is the money less toxic uh, in those areas when it comes as a grant rather than, you know, as some sort of secret gift? <laughs> you know, I, I've been wrestling with this a lot because I know that um, I think a lot about the Lenfest Institute, which administers a whole bunch of these. And I know that the Newmark um, School uh, through CUNY has also done some of this. And I think that, you know, the redistribution 
creation through a grantor, a grant sort of some, some sort of body that is able to intervene as an intermediary, um, I think is really important um, because it allows for some distance. At the same time, right, that same aspect of capture is present too. And I love that phrase capture because look, when I've spoken to some of these big sort of like intermediary foundations, it's really hard to just get them on the record to explain their relationships. And so, I mean, not only do we have growing distrust in um, news organizations overall, but if we don't want to have further growing distrust because of murky philanthropy either. And so I think that you know, it's a start. I think that there's, it's better than just sort of these shadow things that are happening, but I think it's a problem. Yeah, if I can just briefly jump in on this one, because it's a hobby horse. It's, I think, yeah, I mean, I actually, I'm sure I have no idea who pays Dr. Usher's salary, but there, but if you just see a panel of journalism experts at a conference or on television, more often than, than not, their salaries are paid by Google and Facebook, and they aren't speaking journalism, they're speaking for tech. And a lot of like the most prominent people who are quoted as like experts on journalism are basically spokespeople for the tech industry. And it makes me crazy. Name some names, Ben. Uh, I, I would ask. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Jarvis is the most prominent. <laughs> well, you know, you can, and you know, not to take this too far beyond journalism, because I know there's plenty to talk about, but that, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, I mean, if you, if you want to report on any major issue that the platforms have a stake in, you can bet that the academics that you would call the majority of them are going to be salaried. Um, the people writing the amicus briefs that the Supreme Court will see for certain rulings could be well on salary. I mean, this is this is an entire industry that is, uh, it's difficult and it makes me crazy too. The Wall Street Journal, I, should, I, I think did some really great reporting a couple, I think it was a couple of years back on this that really kind of brought awareness to the, the breadth and depth and people are getting more careful. But I remember, I'm old enough to remember, I'm 51. I, you know, do you remember in the eighties and nineties when everybody was just like, I don't know, they would call these people and just like take the party line. There was no questioning of the party line, you know? And I remember even as late as in 2007, I was in uh, at the World Economic Forum in Davos and I was invited to one of those you know, secret, like, ooh, let's go to the cool Google, um, you know, lodge and hang out and sit on bouncy balls kind of meeting with 10, you know, specifically chosen, called in advance on their cell phone, secret location journalists, and went in and we were talking, it was just when they had um, bought uh, YouTube, and we were talking about the future of the news. And we were there to be told everything's going to be okay, don't worry, we're your friends, blah, blah, blah. And I remember sitting there and thinking, God, like, this isn't just about us, although, you know, we're navel gazing journalists. So of course it was mostly about us, but I raised my hand and I was like, what, isn't this kind of about democracy? Like, <laughs> this is not a problem. And I remember Larry Page looking at me from his bouncy ball and kind of being like, well, oh, we have a lot of people thinking about that. You know, no problem, next question. I mean, that was the attitude for a long time. And it, it is really incredible as somebody that has studied capture in the financial industry as well. This is a whole nother level of it, in part because these are the guys, mostly guys, some girls, that um, the people in the media industry go and hang out with in Aspen, in where, you know, in whatever the conference of the day is. You know, uh, if I could kind of speak to the, I think the maybe ideal process for funding. Um, I mean, for one, going to like Google events, I think a lot of people go just for the food. I know I do, but uh, the, uh, but you know, there is a way to do this in a way that I think especially can benefit news organizations that, that need the funding, but also that like is transparent. You know, when uh, Google and Facebook have done their news challenges where it's supposed to be around a particular theme and you're supposed to be building around a specific challenge. There's an open application process. There's publishing of who got the money and how much money they got. Like, that's fine by me. Like, I'm okay with that. The transparency of that, but also that it is for something in particular. You know, I've gotten those grants before. I've applied for those grants before and I had to account for where that money went. And I'm like, this is fine. This is just like any other funder, like, like Ben said, you know, none of them are, none of them are perfect and not, none of them are necessarily clean, but at the very least, 
we know who's getting money, we know what it was for, and we know where it went, and how much of it went out there. And, and in that situation too, being able to benefit nonprofit, local outlets, niche outlets, uh, outlets run by people of color, they have, there are lots of different ways to get money to people who could really use it in a way that is not as ethically challenging as some of the things we've been talking about. So I want to um, just defend the sanctity of the taxpayers of the state of Illinois. And I actually, as an academic, I'm certainly not the only one have taken a firm pledge um, not to take any money from big <laughs> tech. Um, so, uh, but the problem is, is we actually have to use their tools, right? So if I want to look at Facebook engagement, the only way I can do it is crowd tangle, right? Which leads me actually to a question for all of you, which is um, the dependency on the soft side like the infrastructure that these tech companies provide. Um, and so everything from the Google executive suite, right? To Facebook's tools for understanding audience analytics. Um, so I wonder if maybe you can speak to that sort of softer side that isn't really captured by our conversations about money, right? Just straight up money. Um, well, I'm happy to weigh in a little bit. We're actually, and this goes to the point Ben made about subscription versus um, non-subscription models. We actually don't depend so much on that. Um, we have a very, very hard paywall and we have excellent analytics. We still um, make a lot of money just, you know, dealing with very sort of bespoke ad Ad, ad targeting ourselves, you know, we, we talk to our clients, if you want to, uh, I don't know, find the top three um, railroad CEOs and, and give a very high priced ad directly to them, like the FT is your place, but it comes, it, I think that there is that trade off where you're forced into having a pretty, it's not a niche market. I mean, we have like, I think 1.2 million paid at this point, but compared to the times it's, it's, you know, we're dealing with a very specific corporate elite that, it, that we want to speak directly to them. So even, I mean, we do, the FT actually does um, have undisclosed deals itself with um, Google news showcase and Facebook news, but for us, they are about, um, reaching new audiences, which probably means, I, I'm not really party to these business decisions, but it means younger, um, uh, more non-European. Um, our core audience, we can still reach in the old fashioned ways. Uh, Nikki, to respond to your question a little bit. I mean, you know, Rana talked about how uh, the tech bros or the people that, you know, journalists hang out with, uh, some journalists, um, for other journalists, I think the people that hang out with tend to be mostly the people at work. And so I think that one of the issues there is when uh, Facebook is working alongside journalists. Uh, for, so for instance, again, at the Times, they, they, uh, Facebook has given an, again, secret amount of money to support the uh, augmented reality lab there. They, I think they have 12 engineers or something like that working on augmented reality, which is actually mostly used on Facebook and Instagram, which is owned by Facebook. Um, so, so Th th there's influence all over the place. It's a, it's a, it's a miasma. I want to get back to something that Mandy said, and I think it's really important, which is the question of, are there any righteous recipients of tech money? Or is this something that really does need to be mediated in some other way? Um, in other words, I guess, you know, if we could fix everything, um, but still have a cash infusion coming from big tech, where, where ought it go? Is there a morally okay place for it to flow? I mean, the, the best argument that I heard in response to the, the issues I was raising in my article is what are you supposed to do, not take the money? I mean, so I think in the short term, we have to cut people a lot of slack. I mean, I, I think that, uh, I think in the medium to long term, we've got to come up with some, some more elegant solutions. And so I would talk about you know, ways that they can give money at arm's length, ways that, uh, that, that they can be distributed more equitably. To, to Mandy's point, there are you know, certain things that are much more public and upfront uh, compared to others. I think those are, 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 are terrific. Although even in those cases, I think the money can be diverted in ways that are not necessarily great for journalism. For instance, Facebook and Google's obsession with throwing a lot of money at fact checking. 
um, which is uh, has you know, completely distorted the fact checking industry and and uh, I think is is really kind of useless. It doesn't it's not really good effective journalism at this point, um, and it's not a solution to the dissemination of misinformation to at some point you know slap something on it. I'm glad we can all agree that fact checking is bad. Um, but I mean, I, sincerely, um, but I would just say, like, I do think like maybe the right, I mean, I don't think the notion that they just hand out money and which is the best way for them to hand out their charity is really healthy. Like, yeah, agree, agree that when there are opportunities, you know, in the newsroom to spend money, take money, take it. But like, I mean, the, you know, Facebook is not a totally fake thing. Like this is it on my phone. It's a, it's a product that reaches some number of millions of people. Is it, and I think, you know, the notion that, ultimately these publishers are providing actual value to Facebook's audience. I think it's real and that, in that there's some kind of value exchange happening in which publishers are producing something of value that people want and getting paid for it has gotta be what we want here. Not, not can we either politically bully or regulate these monopolists into shearing off some portion of their earnings and kind of sprinkling it on favored publishers. And also add on to that, uh, Ben, that I think that there's also a challenge in that even if you are partaking in one of the tools that they want to bring news into, you know, whether that's Google News Showcase or that's the Facebook News tab, we have no idea how those outlets are doing and what kind of traffic they're actually sending anywhere. Even as a publisher who has been a part of those, I have not been able to see exactly what is coming from there and what is coming from you know, one of our readers sharing something on Facebook or a local group who really hates people wearing masks. Like that's usually where our traffic is coming yeah. from. It's not actually from, you know, the Facebook news tab, most likely. Uh, and that's, you know, very much from a local perspective. But I do think that that also goes a long way if we can have access, better access to our own audience's data as to how they're getting from one place on a platform back on our sites and on our products especially if we can get it on their site even more, which I know is something that the academics of the world are especially eager to get access to and often can't. You know, it's funny. I think that often in newsrooms, they ask, they, they say like that they want to give you data so that you will do what they want. In some ways, I would prefer that they license our content, that they spend their money licensing it and they do whatever they want with it. And I never know what they do with it. And there are platforms like Smart News that just like need content, pay money for content, take it, license it, do whatever. Like that in some ways is a preferable business model. Like I just almost prefer the signal sent by money than by data. So, I mean, I think it, what's funny is this reminds me a lot about the old school aggregation debates, only there's something a little bit darker. And I think it's because the political economy of all of this is that you know, the big organizations are able to actually call up Apple News. They're able to discuss and have conversations with Facebook. And what we've seen with Murdoch in Australia, and I want to tip this off to Rana, is that a single company can cut a preferential deal and throw regulatory efforts under the bus. And so I kind of just wanted to get Rana's, Rana's thoughts on this um, into the panel. Yeah, no, it's... Um... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm torn. I mean, I do agree. I, I agree that um, Murdoch's deal made it harder for everybody else. We knew it would. Um, but at the end of the day, these companies, any company, you know, none of us should be policing ourselves. You know, we need a clear set of shared rules that everybody follows. I think that I you know one of the things I really like at the moment in the regulatory landscape is Europe's efforts to say, okay, everything that exists in terms of regulation and rules and laws in the physical space has to exist in the digital space. And so you, therefore you don't get kind of regulatory arbitrage where forget about just eating journalism, you know, these companies come in and, and go around the cracks and eat finance and healthcare and education, and they don't have to deal with any of the, the regulatory issues that other industries do. I mean, that's, that's just clearly unfair. Um, I do think though that I gotta, I gotta say Rupert Murdoch had it right ages ago when he said that nobody should have ever have given this stuff away for free. And we were real chumps that we did. Um, my guess is that we only have time for just a little bit more. So I guess if there were one thing that we wish 
were more transparent when it came to Google's and Facebook's dealings with uh, news organizations, maybe in one word you could respond with what that would be. I just think everybody should be radically transparent about their relationship with Facebook and Google. I think it's the least we could expect from a news organization. And I do want to just respond to Rana. I, I, I do think the news had to be free at the beginning or else the internet would never have become what it became. And I still think there are ways for a lot of it to be free. I think it's essential for a lot of it to be free. All right, Ben, what's your, your one thing you wish were more transparent? I and mean, the thing I wish, and maybe it's just I wish I understood it better, but I do think that a lot of what's the Google's ad tech sort of stack is a huge part of this story. And, and we would all like to see more clearly inside it. Or maybe, though maybe if we did, it would be confusing still, but probably not. It's one of those things that probably that they like to mystify, but isn't really that confusing. Yeah, I think I'd agree with Ben. Uh, you know, open the black box, algorithmic audits. And I think just even beyond this, the algorithmic audit, I think also of just knowing the reach. I mean, how many people is this actually reaching? Real live people who have seen more than three seconds of this video mm -hmm. and are actually reading this article and are actually clicking in this. Those numbers have been fuzzy for years. And I think of getting a better an idea of that is going to be huge as well. Um, so I was misinformed. Um, or I wasn't misinformed, I was just wrong. Um, and we actually have a little bit more time to chat. And I guess um, something I was really curious about when I was talking to folks for um, my work with OMI and CJL was the culture clash that emerges. And I think we started to hint at that, but let's presume we're gonna be some sort of partners and that's inevitable. How would you describe um, maybe, uh, maybe the culture is the same, maybe the goals are the same, or maybe they're not. I know, um, Rana, maybe you can hit this up. Yeah, no, it's, I think it is a very stark culture clash and I, I see it, um, I see it more and more in the FT in the sense that there are, because we have to think about this now and, and because we have to um, hire people that think that, that are either from the tech industry, they're sort of data analytics person, people they think about search engine optimization, their heads are in a completely different space about what to target, how to target. It becomes all about packaging. I mean, it's a very, it's a very different way. And listen, there are some, I'm very old school. I actually just kind of think about what's interesting to me and write about it. And, you know, people like me read it and seem to, you know, stick with me and the others that don't go read somebody else. Um, but those are really different approaches. Now, what we are finding is that, um, that there are various metrics that they've come up to judge this, but kind of deep, authentic journalism that is either scoop, like real scoop based stuff or highly opinionated, personal, insidery, you know, things like I do a newsletter with another veteran journalist, my colleague, Ed Luce, that's really got a personality and a point of view. Um, even if it's long, even if it's not, you know, uh, optimized for clicks, that stuff is actually turning out to be more profitable for us over the term of the relationship with our readers. So if for us, it really becomes an issue of, do we wanna be in a commodity business? Or do we want to be in a high margin, high value, long-term business with a select group of customers, which we will grow somewhat, but not at massive scale. And that's where we've decided we want to be. Ben, do you have any thoughts? No, I mean, I think, I, I think, I think it's been well said. All right. Manny, you seem like you. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think um, it's worth noting that, you know, depending on who you ask in big tech, that like the biggest problem with journalism and that it is that it's run by journalists and that it has journalists in it. <laughs> and that, you know, if, if we thought more like tech people and thought more like product people and conducted our business and our culture that way, I, I have had many conversations with people at platforms who have argued just that, that we would be better off as a business if we approach things the same way that they do. Uh, but, you know, their way of approaching things is really not extremely realistic all the time. I mean, you can do that when you're building Gmail and you could do that when you're building a search engine. Um, it's a lot harder to do that when you're building a local news investigation about your mayor's corrupt behavior. It's, it's not the same thing. It's not even 
it's not even the same sport, let alone the same the same ballpark. And how would that the, work the ethical the nuances of that are not something that is part of the product atmosphere or part of product world. As a, I have someone who has kind of a foot in both product and in editorial, it is it's not very easy to have both of those things together. But it also means that you know people who are of the product mindset men, eh, mindset do not necessarily understand all the nuances of that goes into journalism and it isn't just something that can easily be replicated at scale but what i mean i, I don't quite understand that because are they talking do they not have respect for the the journalism or are they talking about everything outside the journalism i mean having been doing online news from since 1997 i've seen that there were a lot of times when our product op- people and our tech people should have uh been thinking about uh, things in a much more techy way. I mean, we had we 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 basically lost, you know, this extraordinary franchise to people who thought more technologically than we did. Um, so you know, shame on us. But uh, how what do they think that we should do journalism differently? It's just mind boggling. I mean, I wouldn't say it's necessarily that journalism should be done differently. It should just be done cheaper and by fewer people. And to say that anyone. Got it cares about content that's in a tech company is i think a real stretch i mean Cheap content is, a, is a, it's a crazy. unit it's just a unit that's moved and seen by people uh, it does not mean the same thing that it does to those of us who create it yeah i don't i don't envy mandy's job kind of translating between those worlds because it can be like you really want to pound your head into the wall i mean obviously the basic insights from tech that newsrooms should listen to or that you want to do stuff that you know the audience actually cares about and wants which lots of newsrooms don't do. Like much of what is published gets no traffic and then publishers yell at tech because no one wants to read their boring stories. Like that is a different problem and and a real problem, but not like the fundamental thing that is happening in 2021 anymore. Well, I mean, I think that you raise a really good point then, which is that supply and demand don't always uh, intersect with the public interest, right? And I think it's very obnoxious for a bunch of people who would, if this were normal times, be sitting in Washington to talk as if they could speak about the public interest, right? And so I think um, something I wanted to raise, by that logic, right, the news that people want to consume isn't, is, you know, deeply hyper-partisan content that is maybe factual, maybe not so factual, morally consistent though, weirdly, right? Um, And I'm wondering, like, you know, what's, what's the role, uh, what can, what can institutional news media do with tech other than fact checking to try to reckon with this? Yeah, there's no no easy solution to this one, right? I mean, I do think that, so the sort of incentives on social media toward partisanship are so, you know, deep and real and not, really under the control or related to news, what in news institutions are doing. I mean, I do think you have, you know, this incredibly diverse world of news institutions where some's basic DNA is to feed that hyper-partisanship, you know, Fox, MSNBC, that's their whole reason to exist and predates the internet. And others is to, you know, and other sort of value to their audience is like the FT, for, for instance, is to say like, you know, we're we're going to just give you the facts with which you can make up your minds, and maybe there's a kind of like neoliberal slant or fight markets slant. But but if if its readers thought that they were being spun too hard, they would cancel their subscriptions. And so, I mean, I do think the rise of subscription media will pull in both of those directions at different times. Can I take advantage of the fact that Ben is being such a good sport here and ask you a question? So I focused on the New York Times in my story for a variety of reasons, one of which was that Mark Thompson, the former CEO, had been really eloquent um, in describing the sinister influence of Facebook on news and, and, and talking about the need for uh, collaborative uh, deals rather than individual deals and so on. And then he you know, went, turned around and, and made this deal with Facebook news. And also because of course the Times is, is the newspaper record and is so influential and, and sort of you know, t- sums up sort of the ethical sort of, uh, you know, weight of, of our business. So, so do you feel like at least the Times should be transparent about this deal? Should, should they disclose it when they write about Facebook? Should they be upfront as to how much they're getting? 
Um, let's see. I, I, I like. I'm not a spokesman for the Times. I've been there for a year. I thought about this a lot when we were at BuzzFeed because it was it was my job to think about it. So I think I'd rather talk about that. Although I guess my opinion would be the same, which is that if we are writing about Facebook's, if, when we were writing about anything vaguely related to Facebook's news initiatives, we disclosed that we were taking their money. But if we were saying, if we were writing about how, you know, that we were in a business relationship with them, but if we were writing about, you know, a murder that had happened and quoting from a Facebook post, we did. It was sort of when it was relevant. And by the way, you know, advertising is pretty sinister. All fun transactions should raise eyebrows. There wasn't some pure news. I mean, and news has always sort of been done in spite of the people who provided the money for it, or often has. And so I guess, you know, in these news co- media companies increasingly they just have financial relationships all over the map. And I guess there's sort of a balance of, is it, you know, where, where should you disclose it? I mean, I don't think it should be hidden or concealed. I think when you're certainly when you're writing about anything related to that, to that program, you should disclose it, but, you know, and maybe you should have some page on the site where you disclose all of this stuff actually. But I don't think that a story that every New York times story about that, that mentions Spotify, Amazon, Facebook, snap, Microsoft, uh, uh, Google should have paragraphs disclosing in each case that it has relationships with those companies because basically every major media company now has relationships with every major tech company. Well, and Google and Facebook and Amazon don't disclose these relationships either. So putting it on the uh, incumbents of the news organization, so I think seems a little bit contradictory. Uh, we have higher standards. I mean, we should we should <laughs> keep them secret. I mean, I, I do think like, and it's not crazy for readers to wonder whether it influences journalism. Yeah. You know, just to pick up on what Ben said, and I guess we're almost out of time, but um, I I agree that there are always a lot of icky deals over the years that, you know, I've certainly worked for publications, not so much the FT, but, you know, when I was in magazines for a long time, you would get literal like sections that were paid for by energy companies or telecoms. And, you know, what was what was good and bad about it is you could actually tell because you wouldn't want to read these stories typically you know there was like green cards for five pages you know um that's pretty easy part of the problem here is the opacity and the and the asymmetry of the transaction um not just the the payment of the publishers but the way in which the algorithmic um targeting works i mean that to me is the core problem like you can go way back to sort of Adam Smith capitalism 101 and say, a mar- you don't actually have a fair market. I mean, he literally would have said, you don't have a fair market. If you don't have an equal and clear understanding on both sides of what the transaction is, you never have that when you're dealing with these companies. You simply do not, it's not in the business model. I think it's a great point. And I think the opacity is something that potentially does have a public policy element to it in terms of, of mandating more disclosure. Well, and there's also, I mean, looking historically, there's a big difference between, you know, the local hardware store and Google and Facebook, right? And so I think that we're, we're talking, we need to be careful when we think about these sinister deals, right? Um, I think, you know, one of the purposes of journalists not just talking to other journalists, um, which is like, I think an advantage of being able to talk with and be part of a policy conversation is um, maybe we should end by just thinking a little bit about what policies, what legislation, what regulations would maybe most help um, in terms of transparency uh, or in terms of of something else. Um, I know for me, the thing that I think a lot about is how SEC filings and 10Ks um, should be far more clear on the corporate end about uh, corporate social responsibility, for example. I would like to see the government, you know, put a windfall tax on Facebook and Google and create a very large uh, arm's length uh, journalism funding organization. I think that's essential. Yeah, I actually think that state, there are really interesting opportunities for like careful state level um, funding of nonprofit news. And I think it's hard to imagine sort of certain kinds of metro coverage without it. I think state rather than federal. Awesome. I, I like I like the idea of some kind of digital digital dividend digital tax, um, not just on these guys, but on all data extractors, and you know, ideally um, globally. I guess moving beyond the tax side, I think too of, of regulation that could, in some way, be giving the ownership of one's own data of how they are navigating the internet back to them. Uh, so thinking of our users in that, but uh, all of us too. 
you know, data portability. I mean, the ability to extract information from these platforms that you've given so much information to and and either use it yourself in some other way. Absolutely. Well, terrific. Thank you all to the panelists for an engaging conversation and for your contributions today. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you all. And um, for, uh, that was a, a very interesting conversation. And I uh, uh, do want to, you know, um, say to Ben, we didn't want to put you on the spot too much. We really didn't want you to be the spokesperson for the New York Times. And uh, oh, I don't mind if you work for the New York Times, it happens. Yeah, but you, you did actually a marvelous job just by actually looking back to your time at BuzzFeed, which is, you know, when you were on the, you were the decider. So that's, uh, that was very useful. Um, one thing I just want to uh, note, uh, it, I don't know if this got mentioned before, but uh, Nikki uh, Usher uh, has a book coming out uh, in June, and it's called News for the Rich, White, and Blue, How Place and Power Distort American Journalism. And I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, noted in this event, because uh, it's I've uh, I know it's going to be an important book. I have inside information about that. Um, so uh, we have just, we're going to be shifting over to our uh, final conversation. Uh, we're going to have uh, Rod Sims uh, as our, uh, the, the sort of, who is uh, one of the major actors in this drama right now from Australia. Uh, Rod has woken up very early in his morning in Sydney, uh, and uh, he's going to be uh, sort of uh, engaging with us in just a, a couple of minutes. Uh, and uh, I believe he's online, so we can, uh, but uh, one thing I just wanted to say, as someone who ran a magazine for seven years in which we lived out of the mailbag, we paid our way through advertising. Uh, you know, I think advertising is, the idea that advertising is always sinister, that there's always strings attached. Um, yes and no, you know, if you have a very diverse set of advertisers, uh, it doesn't matter if there's actually a lot of strings attached, you know, from any one advertiser. So there's a real difference in having two corporations, Google and Facebook, uh, basically with, you know, giving all kinds of funny money to basically every major player in the journalism space, or, you know, having the devilness of advertising broken into 10,000 pieces or 100,000 pieces. You know, if, if the devil is broken into 10,000 pieces or 100,000 pieces, the devil can't achieve what he means to achieve. But if the devil's in two pieces and those two pieces are actually colluding as the Texas case shows, uh, we're in a lot of trouble. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, um, now, um, uh, so I'm gonna just actually do my introduction um, for the next panel, because we have a couple of people who are gonna be sitting uh, from one panel onto the next, uh, including Ben and Rana. Uh, so uh, this next panel is, uh, we have um, uh, Rod uh, Sims, uh, who is the chair of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. He's uh, been the chair since uh, August, 2011. Uh, and uh, He's uh, been the longest serving chair of the a ACCC. Uh, previously, uh, Rod was the chairman of the Independent Pricing and Regulatory Tribunal in New South Wales. Uh, and he uh, was commissioner on the National Competition Ca Council and he was a member of the Research and Policy Council of the Committee for Economic Development of Australia. Uh, Rod and his team have done a some really important research. Uh, they've really they built uh, on the report that the CMA put out last year. Uh, they have provided uh, sort of the raw materials for other regulators uh, around the world to work with. Uh, and I know Rod's got his own um, sort of issues that he's going to be raising. And then the the um, the moderator for this next panel is uh, my very dear friend and colleague uh, and partner, uh, Phil Longman. Uh, Phil Longman is, uh, you know, is one of the, is without Phil Longman, open markets wouldn't exist. Uh, he was, uh, along with Lena Khan, um, he was our, uh, one of our first two hires. And uh, uh, when Phil, as uh, Paul Glass just mentioned before, is one of the uh, most gifted editors in, uh, um, of our time. And uh, I've had the privilege of working with him for, for many years now. And 
Uh, so uh, I'm going to turn this over to, I guess, Rod first, and then, or uh, and then Phil, or maybe Phil will introduce Rod. I'll let you guys sort that out. Here I am. So hello, everyone, um, and thank you, Barry, for that very generous um, introduction. Um, We've been hearing all day uh, about Rod Sims, uh, the Honorable Rod Sims. Uh, and we're so grateful um, that he's finally woken up. Uh, it's, uh, we've been waiting, waiting, waiting for you to wake up. Um, uh, and uh, so now it's uh, 6 a.m., I believe, where you are. And um, uh, your name has come up in, in many different contexts throughout the day because uh, in many ways, uh, the eyes of the world are on Australia when it comes to this subject. Uh, just notice that CMS, CNBC just moved a story a few hours ago with the headline, after Australia, the wrangle between publishers and big tech has reached new levels. So you are, I think, in some ways, the man of the hour here. And we would love to hear you talk a bit um, about what's going on in Australia, for those who don't know, and what your role is at does that sound good for you? That sounds very good. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Excellent. Great the technology is working. Well, look, thanks, Barry. Thanks, Phil. And thanks to the open market teams for this opportunity. And uh, look, I much prefer uh, doing international things at this hour than I do at the other end of the day. Six o'clock is fine. I'm on my uh, second cup of coffee. I'm in, I'm in great shape. So this, this time is great. And I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, allowing me to come on at this time. I do have to apologise for the tie. Uh, I'm one of those rare people who actually likes wearing ties. So this is a fashion statement, not a political statement. It's, uh, I'm one of the rare people in Australia who still wears a tie. So I don't want you to judge the nation on the basis of uh, what I'm wearing. Indeed, I feel sorry for IT types who can no longer, they're not allowed to wear ties anymore. And I still am, so I do. On to the code. Uh, so, I mean, the ACCC is the competition and consumer enforcer. We enforce antitrust laws, we enforce consumer laws, uh, we enforce product safety, um, and we enforce, uh, uh, we regulate monopoly infrastructure, and that's relevant to what I'll talk about today. The bargaining code idea came out of our 18 months inquiry into a range of digital platform issues, which included advertising, included media, but really got to grips with the bargaining power of Facebook and Google. Um, it was clear they were in a very dominant position. And we had 23 recommendations from our inquiry, and one of them was for the news media bargaining code. The idea of the code is to even up the bargaining position between news media businesses and Google and Facebook so that you can have a proper negotiation over what's the appropriate value transfer between the two. Yes, the platforms provide value to the news media businesses in terms of links, but I think there's much more value going the other way. Uh, Google search depends a lot on getting media links, coming up with media links. Facebook, of course, they call it the news feed. Um, of course, it covers a range of things, but it does provide uh, news, amongst other things, as it tries to provide an all-in social media service. So the idea of the code is to even up the bargaining power, because otherwise you just can't negotiate with a monopoly. And Google is effect effectively a search monopoly. Facebook's very close to a social media monopoly. So it's impossible to have a proper negotiation. All you get is a take it or leave it arrangement. So what the code does is it sets up a negotiate arbitrate framework. That means both parties are required to negotiate and if they can't reach a deal, it goes to arbitration. That ability to go to arbitration is what evens up the bargaining power. Uh, you can't just say it's take it or leave it. No, no, you've got to negotiate and if you don't, it goes to an arbitrator. Now, no one wants it to go to an arbitrator, but the fact that it can evens up the bargaining power and you can then do commercial deals, which otherwise you cannot do 
with Google and Facebook. So the, the code brings about commercial deals, fair deals, but otherwise you wouldn't have. So, and of course, the importance of that, which is why we're here, is that it allows media businesses to get appropriate payment for their content. Uh, and absent the code, uh, absent the ability to have proper negotiations, you would not get fair payment for content. Therefore, journalism would suffer and therefore society would suffer. It's quite, quite clear that journalism is a crucial underpinning of our society. You need a range of it. You need diversity, but you need it uh, because it is the crucial uh, it, it, it's one of the key ingredients of society. So you, you have bargaining balances, imbalances in a range of places in society, and some matter, some don't. But this bargaining imbalance matters because it affects how much money goes to journalism. So um, it's a negotiate arbitrate model. It's a model that we use when we have monopoly infrastructure. It could be, I mean, it started with telecommunications. Uh, where our dominant company that provided the copper wire to people's homes was required to provide access so that other telecommunications companies could come in and compete with it. And so a negotiate arbitrate arrangement was set up. But it also applies to gas pipelines and uh, potentially can apply to a whole range of monopoly infrastructure. So, so that's where it comes from. And yes, it's been adapted to the media bargaining position, uh, but, but that's where its philosophical roots come, come from. I should add very quickly that the, the code allows collective bargaining. Now, I understand we'll, we'll get onto this topic a little later, and I understand it's, to me, strangely, uh, something that's controversial in the US. But when you've got a monopoly, our law allows the players who want to connect to the monopoly, say um, a bunch of companies trying to send minerals overseas, and we've got a lot of those in Australia. But if you've got a monopoly port, our system allows them, the, the users of the port, to collectively bargain with the port. That brings about more even bargaining. Uh, that brings about um, more economic efficiency. So we did find it strange when we had arguments from Facebook, particularly, that allowing collective bargaining was somehow in violation of antitrust principles. That statement misunderstands what antitrust is all about. Antitrust is about promoting economic efficiency. And so there was nothing wrong at all with allowing collective bargaining when the party on the other side has all the bargaining power or is a near monopoly. But the fact that we can have collective bargaining means that the smaller players can get together and also have uh, enough power to get themselves good deals. Now, just finally... Um, because I was only to kick off for three or four minutes and my coffee's getting cold as well. In Australia, we have at a high level, I mean, obviously in media, the online and offline worlds have come together. Uh, so, you know, we've got um, a TV radio companies that, that are now effectively print companies because they've got online. And, you know, I get a feed from our Australian Broadcasting Commission probably 10 times a day of their online articles. So I'm reading the news of the Australian Broadcasting Commission, whereas once upon a time I would have only watched it or listened to it. So you've got that coming together. In Australia, we've got four large media organisations covering print, TV, radio, and a lot of people still get their news from TV and radio. Um, all of those TV, radio just about all of them, have an online presence. We've then got three or four, and, and sorry, of those top four companies, three out of four have got deals with Facebook and Google, and the fourth one is, is close, as I understand. We've then got three or four sort of mid-tier players. Some of those have got deals, some, some haven't. And then we've got a lot of small independent players, and many of those have got deals. So one argument against the code is that it favours the big players, and the small players lose out, it's just wrong in fact. But the thing I want to say about the code just to finish up is I often get asked, is the code the way forward? And I say, no, the code is part of a suite of measures that are relevant to journalism. It's not, we, we never said the code was the answer to journalism. We said the code 
is the answer to one problem journalism faces, which is the lack of bargaining power with Google and Facebook. So in our recommendations, we said uh, provide funding for uh, particular types of media, particularly in regional areas, local council coverage, all that sort of thing that's happening. Uh, also funding for our newswire and government funding there. Uh, in Australia, uh, we have considerable funding for public broadcasters. So one of the big four, the Australian Broadcasting Commission, is government-owned, uh, gets a billion dollars a year, uh, but we also have a second publicly-owned uh, broadcaster and radio player as well, special broadcasting service, which is actually quite quite big. Um, so, yes, the code gives more money to the bigger media companies. I mean, it has to. This is evening up the bargaining position. This is allowing bargains. So if you employ more journalists, you'll get more money because you're providing more content. So the code was aimed at a fair bargain with between the media companies and the platforms. When people say to me, yes, but it doesn't, you know, particularly target new journalism, uh, it doesn't weight the money more to smaller players, I say, well, that's, that's a different objective. Our objective was to make sure journalism as is gets its share of its appropriate return on the value it creates. If you want to, in, in addition, and I say in addition, give money to smaller journalism companies, absolutely do that. And, and we recommend it and the government is doing that. So that's a different way of dealing with things. And of course, we've got our, our public journalism. We also recommended taxation benefits for philanthropic contributions, provided they're completely independent to the media and a range of other things, which I, I won't go into. So my key point is the code was never meant to be the answer. We happen to think it's a very important part of uh, uh, what's needed to uh, sustain quality journalism going into the future. Uh, so with that, Phil, I'll, I'll leave it there. Happy to take this wherever you want to take it. And I'll drink okay. my coffee. Okay. Drink up. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, Ron, in the previous panel, you, you expressed some thoughts about um, this deal. Uh, how do you think if, if this were something analogous to this were negotiated in the United States, how do you think it would play out? What, what good would it accomplish? What things would it leave unsolved? Well, um, you know, until we actually have rules allowing collective bargaining on the part of the, the publishers, we'd probably end up back where we were in, um, what year was it that the big book publishers had their fight? Mm, yeah. um, you know, uh, which is so, I mean, that the idea of, I mean, any, but probably a lot of the people watching this have either written a book or, you know, read books, <laughs> maybe publish books. The idea that the top three book or five, whatever it was, book publishers, it could hold a candle to a tech platform is just absurd. And yet, you know, they had the book thrown at them. That was because of um, the way that Monopoly was being thought of at that point. And, and thanks to a lot of efforts, including many great efforts by open markets, I think Monopoly uh, power is being thought of in different ways now. It'll be interesting to see with Lena Khan coming on to the FTC, um, you know, some of the other changes afoot. Uh, but I expect that it would play out pretty similarly, that the, the biggest news organizations would cut the best deals and everybody else would cut lesser ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ms. Sims, how, how do you enforce um, solidarity? I mean, what is to stop in this collective bargaining process somebody to effectively be a, a scab to go make a separate deal? Ah, that, that, thank you for that. that. That is the key difference between a negotiate-arbitrate model and collective bargaining, right? If, if collective bargaining is on its own and does not have arbitration, then you run a big risk of, uh, and I guess that's the issue in the US where you've got a bill to allow collective bargaining, but there's no arbitration. Right, so, you, so the question you've posed is exactly the right ones. What are Google and Facebook going to do? They're going to do deals with some players. They're going to pick them off, and, and that's how it'll play out. Uh, and so you've got that problem. In our world, you don't have that problem, right, because there's negotiate arbitrate for everybody who qualifies. So if Google and Facebook go and do a deal with 
two or three companies initially, right, they're the first deals they do. And the first deals, well, it, it, then the other players have still got the right to negotiate and to go to arbitration in their own right. So they're not cut out. That The problem with collective bargaining without arbitration is you can have selective deals which cut the others out. You can have scabs, if I picked up your term correctly. Mm -hmm. But it's irrelevant with arbitration because every one of the players, you know, all of the, the tens and tens of, of media companies all have the individual right or the collective right to go to arbitration. They can't get cut out. Right? You can Google and Facebook can do a deal with, with company one, but company two, three, and four can go to arbitration. The smallest companies can go to arbitration. Our regional newspapers, of which there's about 180 in Australia, will bargain collectively. They will get together under an organisation called Country Press Australia and they will do a, a, a deal. And the deals that have been done by the top four media companies uh, and the next tier and the other ones is just irrelevant. They're, they're there with their own ability to seek arbitration. So arbitration means that you don't have that collective bargaining problem. Without arbitration, you do. Does that make sense? It does. It, it leaves the question, who picks the arbitrators and what are their metrics for arbitrating, right? Uh, so, so the under our code, the arbitrators are selected by our media regulator we have a uh, a media and communications regulator you know the media regulator will step in if there's in, in, incorrect or inappropriate things done on media i don't fully understand their, their complete role they also are people who allocate spectrum and things like that so they select the arbitrators um uh there's criteria about what their backgrounds are in law and economics and things like that and mm -hmm. the the parties can either agree an arbitrator that is the digital platform or the uh, and the media company can either agree an arbitrator but if they don't agree one then one gets appointed from that panel that this government body has has arranged so they are independent arbitrators and the essential criteria is to work out the value uh provided but to both sides, also uh, to uh, take into account the cost of producing the product. And what we've done is chosen uh, a form of arbitration, which is what I think you call in the US baseball arbitration, so that you get one shot, each side puts in their best bid and the arbitrator chooses the best. Now, the arbitrator has an ability to adjust what it considers the best offer, uh, but with baseball arbitration, you don't have any, you, you can't have put in ambit claims. I mean, if you're way out here and the other party comes somewhere in the middle, they'll get chosen. Also, the ACCC, in my organisation, plays a role in that to help advise the arbitrator. So I think we've got it, obviously, given we have a role, I would think that we have got it pretty well covered as to independent arbitration and rules that should bring about uh, an appropriate result. But I'm not, obviously the arbitration is tricky, but mm -hmm. what we're seeing so far is people are doing deals without recourse to arbitration, but that threat of arbitration is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like you, you need, uh, you're, you're setting prices through a non-market mechanism, right? You're, you talked about the cost of creating the content, mm -hmm. the value of the content, but that's not a market determined content presumably a bureaucratically determined. So to me, it raises the question, why, why do you even need the arbitration? Why not bureaucratically determine what is the proper value of this journalism, which would also allow you to interject other social values, such as it's the kind of journalism we think of as serving some public good or public interest or another. Okay, if I could address that. The, um, uh, the deals all done so far are deals that have been commercially negotiated. They haven't had yet to resort to arbitration. And what we find in Australia is it's the threat of arbitration that evens up the bargaining power, but the companies usually avoid arbitration because they just don't know whether they'll win or lose out of that. Mm -hmm. So they do a deal. And therefore, they've done their own deal. Um, and so far, the media companies in Australia are happy with the deals they've done, so they think they're getting value. 
if they think they're getting that value, that's fine. I guess the other thing, Phil, I do feel strongly about is in in my profession, which is economics, that there's uh, 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 someone won a Nobel Prize a long time ago for saying have a range of objectives and have a range of instruments to achieve those objectives. Now, the code is meant to make sure there's proper payment for journalism. And I think the more you've got that done by the media companies themselves, two, two of them are government owned, but there's a whole range that aren't, the better. Government's not involved in that. There's money paid for, for journalism. Once you've got that done through what I think is a commercial process, Phil, because they are agreeing it, then you can superimpose, okay, how do we want to tilt the playing field to new media, diverse media, media we may be short of, then government set up a process, uh, put money in, hopefully at arm's length, and, you know, tilt, achieve the, the diversity equity objectives, the social objectives as an add-on. But I think that underpinning of journalism being able to argue its own case and get its own deal is the better way to do it. I, I don't think I'd want the government doing the whole thing. I see. Great. Well, um, before we go to questions for the audience, I'd like to give Ben Smith a chance to jump in here and give us his take on, on the promise or the perils of this approach and what the, its actual rollout has revealed about the power structure of the global media. Yeah, because I'm not sure I have a take. It's good to see you, Rod, and, and always fun to talk to you. Um, I think I would love your take on, I mean, I think my perception from afar and of what's happening here is that this is driven largely by News Corp, by News Corp using its muscle to beat Facebook up on Fox News, for instance, and Google, um, and to move the Australian government and have, you know, senior ministers very, very responsive. Um, is, it, is, that, is that accurate? Are you basically a Rupert Murdoch minion? <laughs> Thanks, Ben. I appreciate that question because that's, I mean, it was interesting, Ben, when we, I mean, we came up with uh, uh, this idea. Um, uh, Google's whole response was, this is big business taking over the internet. Uh, they played into the Murdoch line, uh, ran that very strongly. Um, I did point out that uh, News Corp internationally is about 1% of the value of Google. So the idea that, I mean, you can say what you like about the Murdoch empire, that, that, that's fine, go for it. But but the idea of Google's trying to say they're big business and we're the little guy, you know, 100 times bigger. No, I don't think it is right to, to answer the question, uh, you know, at all. I mean, obviously, News Corp has backed the code, uh, as has just, just to, I mean... <laughs> The, the other party that played a, a huge role was The Guardian. The Guardian has a, a presence in Australia through Guardian Australia. It's got some excellent journalists in it. So it's its own entity in Australia, and it played a big role as well, as did uh, the other player who played a very big role was the Nine Network. It's a funny name for a news organisation, but it's, uh, it started being Channel 9, a TV station, but the Nine Network owns the, the only financial, national financial newspaper in Australia. It owns what used to be called the sort of broadsheet newspaper in Sydney and in Melbourne. And it has the main commercial radio stations and it's one of the top two TV companies. So it's a very powerful player. Uh, so it was also very strongly behind the code. Uh, I've had comments from... Uh, smaller media companies who are very strongly supporting of the code, a company called ACM, I think it's Australian Com Community Media. I use acronyms and sometimes forget what they are, but they were very strong. So no, I mean, not surprisingly, Ben, we had all the media companies in favour of it. I mean, as I say, no, no surprise there at all. Um, I, I do understand that uh, News, media, uh, News Limited, Rupert Murdoch, uh, uh, Robert Thompson have been talking about this issue for some time all around the world. Um, uh, but, you know, they had a range of proposals into us, which we rejected. You know, their original idea was setting up a, an algorithm board, a board to look after algorithms. Well, we didn't think that was a very good idea. So they had a range of ideas we really didn't like. So there's no, it is just, 
untrue that the idea for the code as is is something that came from News Limited. Indeed, some of the other media companies were more influential in this particular model than News Limited was. But there's no doubt they support it, as I say, but every media company in the country does. Great. I have a question for you from an audience member. He asks, um, can you talk about the non-discrimination requirement, I believe called non-differentiation? in your code and whether that's necessary? Does that mean anything to you? Oh, yes. No, that's, there's, there's two, I should have said earlier, so thank you to whoever yeah. asked the question, uh, that there's two fundamental underpinnings of the code. Uh, one is the negotiate arbitrate model where you've got the resort to arbitration. And the other one is the non-discrimination or what's called non-differentiation. What that means is you can't do a deal with some players and not do a deal with all. Hmm. It, you, you, and so I should have mentioned that earlier, <laughs> Phil. That probably was the missing link. In, in yeah, yeah, yeah. Put a lot of things together. My apologies. Yeah. No, that's yeah. right. My apologies. That's uh, <laughs> I completely missed that. The coffee hasn't taken full effect yet. So the uh, the idea is that if you're, I mean, if you want to leave the country, you can leave the country. If you don't want to show any news, you don't show any news. But if you do show news that's caught by the code, then you've got to do deals with everybody who qualifies. Now, that means that either Facebook or Google, um, I mean, they can't just show international news even and not local news. So not only can they not do a deal with two or three Australian media companies and not the rest. No, they're forced to do a deal with everybody. But they can't say, oh, well, I won't show Australian media. I'll just show international media. They can't do that either. So their, their choice is, and this obviously came up in the, the uh, threats that uh, Google and Facebook made, which obviously helped promote the code enormously, uh, Google were threatening to leave Australia completely because they understood they couldn't even surface in search as international news. Uh, otherwise, that have violated the non-differentiation provision. Facebook said, OK, we'll take all the news off the platform. But the only way they attempted to do that for about a week actually meant they didn't even show... Um, messages from emergency services, health messages, all sorts of things. So it was very difficult for them. So the non-differentiation is as crucial a part as the arbitration. You take, you take media from one organisation, you've got to do it from the lot. And I'm sorry, again, I didn't mention that earlier. But thanks for the question. That's great. Um, so I think um, I, I noticed in, in your remarks you said something that I've, I've heard throughout the day, which, which is that this approach um, uh, is important and useful, but, but not sufficient in itself to, <laughs> to solve all the problems. And I think as we come to the, to the end of this program, I, it, it's worth reflecting that um, uh, we've, had, we've heard lots of different ideas, uh, reform platforms uh, put forward. Uh, they range from an increased uh, role for philanthropy and for public policy to support philanthropic giving to uh, journalism. Um, they include uh, the Kobishar uh, uh, um ideas for um, basically allowing a antitrust exemption to publishers to collectively bargain somewhat analogously to how they might do it in Australia. Um, but I think everyone has agreed that there's ultimately the need for a, a deeper structural remedies um, and that um, uh, ultimately some combination of competition policy and privacy policy is going to be necessary uh, to solve the problem. We, we can find many ways to support local journalism uh, through philanthropic support. Um, but that won't solve the problems of filter bubbles. That won't solve the problem of manipulation. That won't solve the problem of uh, many of the other threats to democracy that are created uh, by the world as we find it uh, in, in tech platforms. So um, I think now it's a good time to, to um, draw to a close and um, to turn uh, the proceedings over to, to my colleague, uh, Jody Brannon, um, who will wrap it up for us. And 
thank you so much for everyone who's participated on this panel. It's been a pleasure. Need to unmute. I'm there. I thought we were going to toss briefly to Barry. Um, tell me if I'm wrong, but um, uh, I think. Well, go, we go ahead, Judy. Okay. Uh, it's been uh, quite a day with 10 memorable conversations and presentations with 30 pres uh, presenters and participants. You know, we at Open Markets and CJL are working on a paper that explores the central questions raised today of how to structure the news and information markets of the 21st century. Today's panels will go a long way to keep us intellectually engaged for weeks to come. Um, clearly, the future of journalism and democracy is a complex issue. Uh, we look forward to continuing the de debate with people from all corners of the globe, not just today's panelists, but any of those of you who are watching who care about working toward lasting solutions to the competition challenges facing news producers in our democracy. So, please contact us anytime. Uh, our work continues thanks to our supporters, including the Knight Foundation and our partners at Washington Monthly. And, and this event could not have happened uh, without Open Markets All-Stars, uh, Catherine Dill, Jackie Filson, and of course, the OMI speakers involved today, uh, Barry Lynn, Phil Longman, and Sally Hubbard, and our CJL advisors, Nikki Usher and Millie Tran. Um, uh, Barry, did you want a final remark? Well, yeah, actually, I'm just going to add a couple more folks at uh, the Open Markets team. I mean, Ken Zeta, I know, worked really uh, hard on this, and, and, and Gina. Uh, Daniel Hanley did uh, Yeoman's work on the uh, our big documents, which will be coming out shortly, as you mentioned. Uh, Claire Kellaway helped. Uh, you know, this is very much a team effort. I know everyone actually had their hand in this, and uh, it's, you know, uh, it's that behind-the-scenes work which really makes a, an event like this come together. But uh, right. is it possible to make one last comment or is that cheating? Really? Yeah, no, sure. Sorry to do this to you, but I, I just noticed Phil's comment and I should have jumped in when he said it. But, you know, our recommendations had not just recommendations on the code, not just recommendations on funding for additional funding from the government for specific journalism, funding for the public broadcasters, funding for uh, tax breaks for th philanthropic contributions. We also recommended... Uh, redoing our privacy legislation. It, we recommended a misinformation, disinformation code where the platforms would be forced to take down certain material. So the code wasn't the only thing. It was a suite of measures and it'd be good that people not just look at the code, but look at those other measures that we put in, because I think they do deal with many of the things that uh, Phil just mentioned uh, there. And as I say, I should have jumped in earlier rather than in the middle of you uh, thanking everybody, but uh, sorry for that last intervention. No, no, it's, uh, uh, no, and thank you again, Rod, for waking up. Uh, well, I guess you, you said that you're usually your second cup of coffee, but joining us so early and, and for all your hard work, we know that you actually have, have really taken the lead on a lot of this and have inspired a lot of people. And that uh, you know you have you and your team stood for a week or so, kind of alone, fighting uh, two of the largest corporations, perhaps the two largest international corporations in human history. And so uh, we, uh, uh, you know, uh, people have noticed that, and uh, we certainly appreciate that. And. Um, and actually, I just want to last thank to everybody who took part in this this uh, conversation today. We hosted a number of these events over the years, you know, going back to, um, you know, five years ago almost. We had a, a, our first discussion about how Google and Facebook were destroying the news uh, at an event at which uh, Senator Warren spoke. Uh, and I uh, cannot, you know, revolutions take place. You don't really see them. You know, it's like... Um, uh, until after the fact. And I think in some ways we, we've seen a revolutionary change in people's attitudes and in people's actions. You know, even three years ago when we had a similar conversation, nothing was happening. And now there's actions all around the world. Uh, and uh, as uh, Congressman Cicilline said earlier today, change is coming and uh, we're going to make it. And we're going to make it work for the American people. And then we're going to make it work for the Australian people. We're going to make it work for the British people. We're going to make it work for the, the people of India and South Africa and Brazil and every democracy in the world. So uh, we're going to 
break the power of Google. We're going to break the power of Facebook. And uh, we're going to uh, make their technologies safe for democracy uh, and for all democracies in the 21st century. So uh, thank, thank you to everybody.